Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 12th meeting in 2018 of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. Could I please make, ask everyone to make sure their mobile phones are on silence? Apologies have been received from Richard Lyle. I would like to welcome Kate Forbes to her first meeting of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. Welcome. And I'd also like to take this moment to thank Fulton McGregor for his contribution and work to the committee. He, he will be missed, um, but um, I'm sure Kate will, will stand in well for him. Uh, Kate, as it is your first uh, committee meeting, I would like <coughs> to invite you as a new member of the committee to declare any interest relevant to the committee's remit. This was in accordance with section three of the Code of Conduct for Members. Do you have any interest you want to declare? Thank you very much, Convener, and I have no relevant interest to declare. Thank you very much. We're then going to move straight on to agenda item two, which is a session with transport and passenger uh, representatives. Before I introduce the panel, uh, could I ask if there are any members of the committee who would like to declare any interests in relation to, to, to this? Stuart. Um, uh, convener, I'm the honorary president of the Scottish Association of Public Transport and honorary vice president of Rail Future UK. And I suppose since I'm speaking, I should say I have a senior rail car, uh, senior bus pass. I do have a senior rail card as well, yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, John. I'm a member of the cross party group in rail and a member of the RMT parliamentary group. Okay. I'm, I'm not sure you have to declare cross-party cross groups, but, but, but thank you for that. Uh, Gail and then John. Thank you, Convener. I am the Honorary Vice President of Friends of the Far North Line. Okay, and John? Well, as cross-party groups have been mentioned, I'm the co-convener of the cross-party group on rail. Okay, I'm, I'm not sure in future <coughs> we need to, to worry about cross-party groups <coughs> declarations, but, but thank you for doing that. Um, now, as we're going to take evidence on transport issues from passenger representatives, I'd like to introduce the, the panel. First of all, uh, Sheila Fletcher, who is a, a Mobility and Access Committee, member of the Mobility and Access Committee for Scotland. Hussein Patwa, who's a, again a member of Mobility and Access Committee for Scotland. Robert Sampson, who's a senior stakeholder manager for Transport Focus. And Gavin Booth, the director for Scotland Bus Users. Um, and also a special welcome to anyone watching this transport session on Facebook Live. For uh, witnesses to the committee, if, what, what I would do is that each of the committee members will have questions for you. You don't need to push any of the buttons on your panels. That will all be done for you. If you'd like to answer a particular question, if you raise your hand, I will pick the appropriate moment to bring you in. Um, and I will ask you to keep your answers as brief as possible. That saves me trying to interrupt you um, if, if I'm worried about uh, time. So thank you uh, for, for that. Uh, I think the, sorry, the first question, I should have got that lined up while I was talking. Uh, the first question is from Mike Rumbles. Mike. Thank you very much. Good morning, Pat. I want to focus my line of question on bus transport. And um, for the first time, bus passenger numbers have fallen before the 400 million journeys a year for the first time since we've got the records for. So why do you think this is happening? And I'm, I'm also conscious, if I can ask a, sub, a second part of this question, that the Scottish Government have a review of the bus, um, you know, the free bus uh, pass for the over 60s at the moment. Um, considering that we're trying to get more people out of their cars and to use buses. Why do you, why do you think bus um, journeys have fallen under the 400 million mark? And what should we be doing about it? Okay, I'll start off with Gavin. Um, Gavin. Thank you. Good morning. Um, this is not just a Scottish phenomenon. It, it's something that's happening across the UK. Uh, people's buying habits, people's travel habits are, are changing. We see... Uh, a lot of passengers that would normally be travelling, uh, commuting for instance, are, are home working and that obviously has an impact on passenger numbers. And online shopping uh, particularly we, we see as one of the problems that uh, is leading to a reduction in, in numbers. People are choosing to, to shop online rather than go into the high streets and, and we see in the high streets the, uh, the result of that as well. So I think these are the, the two sort of most obvious 
explanations, if you like, for the, the fall in numbers. Mm -hmm. So how, how, what do you think we can do about increasing bus transport, considering that almost half the revenue is public money? How, how, how can we increase bus use across Scotland? So, Gavin, if you'd answer that, then I'm going to bring in Robert and then I may be bringing Stuart to follow up. So, Gavin. I think, I think there, are, there are ways, there are <coughs> examples around Scotland where uh, partnerships between bus companies, between bus companies and local authorities have resulted in uh, st stabilising of the uh, passenger loss and an increase in, in passenger numbers in particular areas. The, 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 the pattern is, is different. In the east of Scotland, the fall in passenger numbers is much less than in the west of Scotland and in other parts of Scotland. Uh, and I think this is, to a degree, because of the, the work that has been done when one of the major bus operators withdrew from the borders and from East Lothian, uh, local bus operators, both large ones and small local independent operators, got down, sat down together with the local authorities and planned what would happen as a result. And the result is that uh, there are good services being provided, new buses being bought. So partnership of that kind, to my mind, is the way forward if that can be replicated throughout Scotland. Mm -hmm. Okay, Robert. Uh, yes, we did a piece of research, though it was in England, but it was in rural areas and urban areas as well. And one of the reasons why bus patronage was falling was the buses weren't running at the times that suited the passengers going to work for nights out. There's also issues around the length of journey, journey time. And also, we've done another piece of research with young people in bus 14 to 19 year old, old and there's a fear of actually not knowing the system. If you're going into a, a first time using a bus, how do you actually go about it? You know, the, I, and a lot of people ask their parents, but it's a generation where parents don't actually have the experience of using a bus service either. So there's a lot of barriers to overcome, but the research showed that if services improve, there's 28% of infrequent or non-users in the in areas in England that we surveyed, and I think it's parallel to Scotland, would support or would consider using a bus service. So what we would say, in the trans forthcoming transport bill that's going through Parliament later this year, Whatever structure, we're not really interested in structures as a consumer organisation, we're interested in outcomes for passengers, but there should be a strategy, whether it's a franchise, an alliance, partnership, with local authorities and bus operators, how do we actually grow the market? How's the strategy to get non-users and first-time users onto the bus services? That should be an integral part of the transport bill, actually to try and look at ways redressing the balance and getting it back up to over 400 million passengers. Thank you, Robert. Uh, bring in Stuart and then Sheila, I'll bring you in if I may. Um, I just wanted to pick up on what Gavin Booth said about uh, home working and online shopping as contributors to reduce patronage. And I can see the logic of what was said. However, why are those factors not appearing to have the same effect on rail journeys, which continue to rise quite steeply? And I merely make another suggestion, um, which I invite a response to. Uh, for my part, I never used to use the bus until I got the bus pass, and the reason was I didn't know what the exact fare was. And therefore, when I got on a bus on occasion, I found I simply didn't have the right money. And I've always thought that's an immense disincentive for starting to use the bus. Once you're an experienced user, it's not a disincentive. But when you're an inexperienced, infrequent user, it's almost a no-entry sign, to be blunt about it. Is that a fair comment to me and the other one on rail? I think I, I, I possibly can't comment. Robert is possibly better to comment on the rail part of it. I think there are barriers to, to bus use that, that, that have to be broken down, and I, I totally understand what you're saying. I think the fares thing is something I have jumped up and down about for, for years. Going on a bus is one of the few things you do without knowing exactly what it's going to cost you. You go into Marks and Spencers, you buy something, you know what it's going to cost you before you hand your money over. On a bus, very often you don't know. Bus companies are not very good at, at publicising fares, particularly when there's a, a complex series of fares depending mm. on where you're going to. So uh, I've been uh, bashing my head against the, 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 the bus companies to 
persuade them to include some sort of fares information just to make it easier for, <coughs> for all passengers to know how much money do they need, two pounds, do they need five pounds to, to, to make this journey. And it also ties in, I think, with information. Uh, the, the sort of great unknown about bus travel, uh, people have access electronically to lots of information, but at the bus stop, bus companies are, are not always very good at publicising their bus services, at giving actual times. Very many bus stops in Scotland have no information whatever at them. And so a new, a potential new passenger would turn up at the bus stop, look at that and think, I don't want to know, and get a taxi, catch a train, walk, take the car. Uh, so I think there's a lot to be done in terms of removing the barriers, in terms of affairs and information to attract more people to, uh, to use buses. I'm going to bring Sheila in and then uh, I think we maybe go on to the next question which probably leads on. So Sheila, sorry. Okay, I'm here speaking on behalf of disabled people because I'm on the Mobility and Access Committee but also a large number of elderly and older people have mobility problems and they are the traditional bus users. Um, I accept the change in home working and not commuting any longer is having quite an effect on bus usage because people in the categories I've mentioned actually only travel occasionally, they don't travel every day. What we've been seeing, and I'm from a Highland community, we've been seeing reductions in the bus service and this is partly because the local authority budget for bus services has completely collapsed and they are registering school buses and school buses are generally coaches which have steps and anybody with a mobility problem will have a big problem getting off on and off one of these vehicles. Uh, they're also operating at times that are not really convenient because school times, I'll give you an example, they're detained. The bus leaves at eight o'clock. We've had issues with people having to stand around in teen for a considerable length of time in the cold, waiting for the dentist or the doctor's surgery to open or for the connection to get the bus to the hospital in Inverness. So these are all things we seem to have lost track of integration of services. And generally people that travel, and I'm a frequent bus user, we like to be confident that the bus service is going to be there in time, that we're going to make the connection and the, the biggest issue for a lot of people is that we'll be able to get back home again after whatever we've done. And there has been a focus on um, digital, and I'm afraid the people that I'm speaking for today really don't have access to digital communication. So, and there are a number of factors for that. Thank you. I'm going to bring Hussein in there. Um, Thank you, Convener. Just to pick up on Gavin's point about information, um, obviously he mentioned that information is often available electronically, and that's true. Very often that information itself is not produced with considerations of disabled access in mind. Times tables are still very complicated. Very often they use obscure codes. Very often they're formatted in a way which doesn't work for people using access technology. Also, Leaving bus stops aside for a moment, bus stations are also quite often very inaccessible places. And in particular, often it's very difficult to find members of staff to identify people working for bus companies to get information in person. And for many disabled people, it's that person-to-person -person contact which really matters, <laughs> and which gives them the confidence, the information, and the ability to use bus transport. So I think there's a, a balanced approach that's required here. And there are clearly some gaps in terms of connectivity and clearly some gaps in terms of the way in which we communicate with passengers that are contributing to that. Thank you. And I, and I think we, we're going to come on to a whole uh, section on accessibility towards the end of the, the session because I, I think it is a key issue. But thank you very much for highlighting those. The next question uh, is John Mason. Um, I mean, it's really building on the questions that you've already had from Mike Rumbles and Stuart Stevenson um, and, and why the numbers are falling. I just wonder, do you think there's a status thing with how people travel that people's ideal for many people is to have their own car, go where they want? If they can't manage that, second choice is probably the train and bus is only a third choice if you're really stuck. Um, and I wonder if that would be particularly the case in Strathclyde where maybe people have a bit more choice and can get the train. Um, Sheila, you, you shook your head there, so, yep, come on in. Uh, I actually think that, I think there's a mis misunderstanding of the way people use buses. 
Um, older people generally use a bus, a trip, to meet up with friends. And they do that, they don't actually arrange to do that, they actually go to the bus stop and meet the friends and then travel with them and have a great time on the bus having a conversation about everything. Uh, so I, when people say bus is a means to an end, I don't actually think it is. I think the social aspect of bus travel is really important and it enables people in the local community to bond with each other and know what's going on. So I think to keep that going, we really have to have a lot of the traditional means of knowing about buses running. I'll give you an example. In my village, we have liner, liners coming into Invergordon. Very often on days when the liners are in, we can't get on the buses. So somebody very cleverly has put a <coughs> list of the liner dates in the bus stop so that we're aware that we might not be able to travel on those days. It's, it's little things like that that probably aren't national things that need to be done. A lot of bus travel is very, very local. And I have struggled to use the buses in Strathclyde because the system isn't as good as the Lothian Community Transport where you've got, they've got a little map that tells you where the, if you don't exactly know, where, you know where, what, where the route's going, they have a little map that shows you where the route is going. So it's really helpful to have information like that. Thanks, that's helpful. I mean, Mr. Booth, I was going to come back to you as well because, uh, I mean, you, you talked about partnerships and in theory, Strathclyde Partnership for Transport is there and should be a good model. And yet, uh, you know, in Edinburgh, I see the fares are on the bus shelter, bus stop. They're not in Strathclyde. The, uh, there's a like, kind of diagram where the bus is going, uh, exactly Ms. Ms. Fletcher's point, uh, in Edinburgh, but not in Strathclyde. Are, are there other differences? Because we're seeing bus usage falling in Strathclyde, <coughs> Glasgow area, and increasing in Edinburgh. The, the, Kevin. The, there certainly are, and I, I, I think Edinburgh is, is always held up as a, as a good example. They have an advantage in that the, they, there are very few fares in Edinburgh. There's sort of a, a flat fare throughout all of Edinburgh, so it's sort of fairly easy to explain and, and sell to people, whereas in Glasgow and other places there is a, a, a series of fares depending on where you're going to, so selling the fares is a lot easier in, in Edinburgh. Um, I'm sort of, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting the rest of your question. Well, just, just any differences there might be between Edinburgh and Glasgow. I mean, another one in Glasgow is, for example, the pedestrian precincts. And the buses have to do incredibly roundabout routes to get round the pedestrian precincts. Now, the pedestrian precincts are a good thing, but it makes the bus journeys a lot slower and a lot longer. It does, and I think, uh, I think bus operators uh, view pedestrian precincts with sort of mixed, mixed feelings. I think there are, there are arguments for um, allowing buses, but nothing else, into certain areas uh, because pedestrian precincts tend to be where people want to be and if they have a, a considerable walk from the bus to get to where the shop is then uh, that is going to perhaps discourage them but uh, I think there's a, it's a sort of social thing too between Edinburgh and Glasgow I think in Edinburgh uh, the, there's been a lot of investment in the bus in, in the bus fleet in Edinburgh Lothian's fleet and there is a sort of you mentioned the sort of social thing um, Edinburgh buses are used by everybody from sort of the, the, the poorest people to the, the richest people in the city. Uh, and that, that, that is unusual around the country. It happens in London, it happens in Edinburgh, maybe happens in one or two other places, but there's no social stigma about travelling by bus. It's something that everybody does because it, it, we're lucky in Edinburgh to have a, a, a very good bus service. In Glasgow, I think, is a much, or SPT area, is a much, much bigger area and a much more difficult area to, to manage. So I... I I would, uh, I would like to see the same commitment to investment in vehicles and sort of partnership between uh, the bus operators and the, the local authority to, to produce what, you know, what we have here in, in, in Edinburgh. I'm going to bring Robert in and then I'm going to move on to the next question. Robert. Uh, I had a meeting with First Class School on Monday afternoon discussing our latest bus passenger survey results. Uh, what the passengers tell us in Glasgow is uh, one of the things they, they dislike about the bus travel in Glasgow and one of the problems is, is road congestion. That's the, the main barrier to, for punctuality. <coughs> Value for money. Although uh, weekly tickets and longer passes have a better value for money, passenger rating for value money is higher for the single tickets, which are less expensive 
two pound for a single journey. It's a link between level of income and upfront cost of seventeen pound, fourteen pound for a weekly ticket. Although the value for there is there is, is the distinction in the passenger's mind. But there's a link between value for money and, and road congestion, specifically in Glasgow. Thanks, Robert. That, that actually neatly leads us into the next question, which is John Finney. You know, a good morning, panel. Um, and as ever, there's plenty of statistics about, and if I just give you some of them, please. Um, bus fares in Scotland have increased by 5% in real terms in the last five years, and that compares with a, a GB increase of 3%. And in current prices, um, uh, viewing fares in that way that a consumer would, uh, viewing that way, uh, fares have risen by 18% in the last five years. I just wonder what impact these increased bus fares have had on bus passengers and bus use more generally. Can I uh, come Gavin. In? Yes. Um, <clears throat> that, is, that is an old Scotland figure, and, and sadly, as we know, that there are huge variations. There is no sort of common standard throughout Scotland in terms of... of the fares that are charged or the, the distance that you can travel for a particular amount of money. Uh, I, I, sorry to keep coming back to Edinburgh, but Edinburgh people know that they can travel <coughs> fairly far for a, a very reasonable fare. In other cities in Scotland, Aberdeen, I believe, the fares are proportionately that bit higher, and that must be contributing towards the, 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 the rise. Bus companies will tell you that they're having to... to invest in new vehicles, they're having the same fuel costs, they're having the same maintenance costs, uh, and these are increasing all the time, and so they have to increase fares. Uh, I, I accept that that's a practical reason, but I think bus companies could probably do more to, to simplify and to make bus fares more attractive to, uh, to get more passengers on board. John, do you want to lead on to your next question and then maybe I'll bring Robert in as well at yeah, the same thank time. Thank you. Well, well um, Gavin touched on it there and that is the ticketing options they've been alluded to. How could they be improved? Um, and is there a role for the Scottish Government in ensuring improvement? Robert, I'll bring you in after Gavin. Yeah. So, Gavin, if you'd like to lead off on that. Bus companies have been moving pretty fast on um, contactless ticketing and that is... Uh, sort of spreading throughout Scotland and I think within a year or so it should be pretty well universal passengers using bank cards just to, to tap in their bus fare. So that, that is making bus travel that bit easier for a lot of people. Um, a lot of people like, uh, like Stuart Stevens and myself who have uh, uh, senior, senior bus cards uh, and therefore uh, fares I suppose don't go through our minds quite as much as they do for, for a lot of passengers. But our age group make up a, a, a large proportion of bus passengers in Scotland, and bus companies are reimbursed for, uh, for every journey that I make and every journey that uh, Stuart Stevenson makes. Uh, but the amount of reimbursement has been cut over the years, and therefore they are receiving less reimbursement for my journey than they did a year ago, two years ago, three years ago. And that's having an impact on their costings and their, I imagine, having to increase fares to, to make up for that, that difference. And Robert, I'll bring you in. I mean, I think if I remember rightly, uh, I may be corrected, but the budget for concessionary travel has gone up each year um, and it's never all been completely used. Um, I think that's the evidence we've heard. So that, that's your comment in light of that is quite interesting. Robert, do you want to come in? And then uh, I think we'll move on to Kate. Two, two points. We asked a value for money question on my bus passenger survey, but it's only of fair paying passengers, not theirs with concessions. It has a 65% rating of passenger satisfaction overall, which is higher than the, the rail sector. Uh, but also, look, what we find with other pieces of research, there needs to be an improvement in fares and ticketing for an easy to understand system. A lot of time when people come first to the bus network, the knowledge of the fare tickets, the fare and ticketing system isn't there. It's by word of mouth or actually engaging with the bus driver. There has to be a part of the transport bill, some kind of central source that looks after all passengers' needs to actually give what are the fares and ticketing systems that are available in an easy understand format that actually attracts people to the, that mode of transport. It can be done. 
Thank you. Uh, uh, very briefly, John, if I may, because we're well, quite well, In fact, I'll leave it then. It'll probably be picked okay. up later. Thank, thank you very thank much. Thank you for that. Kate. Um. Thank you very much. I wonder if um, Robert, on behalf of Transport Focus, could outline the key Scottish results from the uh, bus passenger survey 2017. And then if I could open it to the rest of the panel to talk about, in terms of regional uh, drivers of satisfaction or dissatisfaction, looking at um, rural areas and urban areas. Okay, who'd like to start on that? Um, Robert, looks I'll, like you're prepared. I'll, I'll start now. Overall, across Scotland, 89% uh, overall satisfaction with passengers. Now, there are, there are different survey methodologies. What we do, when we do it in Glasgow sub Subway, we do it in rail. We ask passengers to actually rate the particular journey they're taking that day, not what do you think of bus journeys overall? It's a snapshot survey of how is that experience from start to finish. There, there are regional differences. Uh, when we last surveyed Lovian buses, for instance, I think it was in 2015, they had the highest value for money rating in Great Britain at 80% value for money. The lowest rating for value for money is in Aberdeen. There, there, there are regional variations uh, the link to value for money, we must ask passengers, why do you give that rating both positive and negative? It's looking at other modes of transport, they compare it with rail, they compare it with the cost of a car journey, and they actually compare it with cost of everyday items. That is, a, that is the reason why they give those ratings for value for money. It's the cost of travel. So the cost of the distance travelled and also relating it to the cost of everyday items in their, in their general spend. So basically yeah. cost is key. Would cost that, is key. Would that be echoed by other panel members? For the disabled community, I don't think it is because they generally have a pass to use in a bus. The problem is access to that transport and I think we're coming back to access later on so I don't really want to go on too much about that. But I think access... Information is another issue, and as, as was said earlier, confusion about how you pay. I'm thinking about school children becoming adults who then commute, and they've always just got on a bus and had, haven't had to pay a fare, and they're really not very bus wise. Um, so I think that's something that we need to improve um, amongst our youngsters if we're going to have them travelling by bus in the future. Mm. I'm going to bring you, Gavin, briefly in, if I may, and uh, I'm mindful of the time and, and, and there are a lot of issues that we'd like to get through, so if I can take Gavin and then I'll perhaps move on. Gavin. If I, I just say, as bus users of Scotland, we, we, we handle, we help to resolve complaints. We have bus compliance people who are out in the field uh, throughout Scotland travelling incognito on buses. So we, we're sort of measuring things in all sorts of ways. We hold... Uh, events where passengers come to us, but one area that we're not, um, are, we decided not to get involved with was was fares because these are uh, a commercial decision by bus companies as to what they charge. So we tend to step back from complaints about fares and refer them to the bus company. It's, but my my own experience travelling around is that that there is too much of a variance between different parts of Scotland and uh, it would be good to see uh, people travelling people travelling around and paying fair, the sort of fares that they would expect to pay, although most people generally only travel in their own area so they maybe don't understand the, the differences in the way that, that, that we do. I, I, I think that's useful. I'm, I, I'm afraid we, we are pushed for time so I'm going to move straight to Gail Ross for the, for the next question. Thank you, convener. Good morning, panel. Um, Sheila, you've touched on it already, and I do want to move on to mobility and, and uh, uh, problems that disabled people have um, on public transport. Um, you, you touched on um, a couple of different things, um, integrated timetables, the lack of access to information, um, but also the access to the buses themselves, I think, is, is possibly an issue. Um, how, how do you think it can be easier for people to to access um, the, the bus services and access the actual buses. I know that there are a few uh, new buses coming in um, on, on different routes, 
maybe not in our area so much. Um, so if you could comment on the, the new buses um, and also comment on the buses that are already in use and the difficulties that people have. Um, and are, are there difficulties between switching between modes of transport? You talked about maybe integrating timetables a little bit better as well. Yeah. Um, Sheila. I think the first thing is that there are two types of vehicle use. There are buses, which are generally, they have to be low floor now. And there are coaches, and for a lot of our rural areas, coaches are the local transport. And coaches have a series of steps. They are wheelchair accessible, but the bus companies have been quite slow at accepting that some people can't climb the steps. Um, so, for example, if you had somebody that, and we have somebody on the committee who can transfer from a chair onto a seat, um, but they they want them just to sit in the wheelchair space, in the wheelchair for the entire journey. And they will not load people in a wheelchair using a lift onto a bus and then store the wheelchair underneath. So there are a few things that would help. The biggest issue for disabled people is that they don't want to feel different from other people. They want to have a ser services that enable them to travel easily and not to sort of be flagged up as having, a, you know, taking extra time to do things. So we, there are very lately, and Gavin and I have actually been to see, I haven't seen the bus actually in action yet, but there's a new type of coach that is going to have the wheelchair and several seats on a, a low floor level, which is about to be introduced in Fife in a few weeks time. It will take a considerable length of time for that to reach all the parts that we are involved in, but it is a big move towards improvement. On the integration issue, this is hugely important because if you have, if you're disabled, you might not be able to walk very far. Rail have passenger assist. There is nothing similar in bus. And you have to ask specifically for help. In some cases, and I travel by megabus quite a lot, the message hasn't got from the head office to the bus that there is going to be somebody that is going to be in a wheelchair. They turn up and then it's a, a, a crisis as to how they deal with it. Um, so we need, we're need we moving forward, but <coughs> we're not really moving forward far enough and fast enough. The other issue is the distance that people have to walk between modes of transport. Um, and although active travel is being promoted for quite a lot of disabled people, they can only walk very short distances. So we have to bear that in mind as well. Thank you. I'll, I'll bring in Robert first. Uh, just one quick point on that, on a, on a positive note. In 2017, we met with Explore Dundee uh, to go over the bus passenger survey results. And about only 80% of passengers with a disability had overall satisfaction. Working on those results, they had a, a period of training with the drivers, various disability awareness training. And this year, when we went back with the results, 94% of passengers with a disability were overall satisfied with the service provided, and an uplift of quite a significant 12 13%. So there are areas where the bus company can actually work proactively with the drivers, who are, at the end of the day is only Con it's different from the rail network. The only contact a passenger will have with the bus company nine times out of ten is going to be with the driver. So specific training can actually help in that regard. It's not the be all and end all, but it, for people with disability who are using the network, the satisfaction improves. It's a good thing. Thank you. I'm going to just bring Gail Ross back in and then we'll move on to the next question. Um, yeah, Hussein, I wonder, do you have any comment from your particular angle of accessing uh, bus and, and rail transport? Absolutely, and I think a large part of the issues involved with accessing buses is going to awareness on the part of drivers and the part of bus company staff. And there appears to be, um, in different areas, different levels of training, different levels of any kind of certification or uh, checks and balances to make sure that the training drivers are receiving is cognizant of the different disabilities and issues that people may have, particularly with regard to hidden disabilities, where that person may have access challenges that are not immediately visible. Also, Sheila mentioned the point about integration, which is a very valid point. 
one thing that's not always taken into account is the length of time it takes. So even though the distance between transit points may be relatively short, it may take that passenger a significant amount of time to get there. And finally, communication between bus companies itself. Uh, Sheila, my colleague, mentioned passenger assist, which will provide you with assistance from your original point of departure to your final point of arrival, including any changes en route um, by train. No such system exists for buses, and very often passengers are left to fend for themselves. Quite often, if the transit point is in a remote area, for example, um, at an out-of-town uh, bus park or lay-by, that may be difficult. There may be nobody there, and there are no immediate ways of contacting the bus company for help or to get in touch with the driver if that becomes necessary. That's very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to move on to the next question, which is uh, Stuart. Uh, thank you very much. Chair, convener. Um, I recognise that Robert Sampson earlier in evidence said he was interested in outcomes rather than structures. Uh, so I'm going to disappoint him by asking a bit about structures. Uh, but, but, but I think uh, there are options in this area that can contribute negatively or positively to, to, to outcomes. Um, and in particular, has anyone got any particular changes to regulatory uh, frameworks or uh, ways we approach things that seems based on the experience and feedback uh, would deliver? Um, now, this could be an open-ended question which could allow you to completely rewrite the regulations. I'm afraid we won't have time for that, so if you could keep the answers probably to, to succinct points, that would be very helpful. Robert, I'll bring you in to start with. Uh, just on the structures, uh, we do a lot of work thanks to uh, funding of the bus companies, regional transport partnerships and Transport Scotland and on bus, but we don't have a statutory remit. But in England, but we do have the statutory remit when the Transport Bill, now Transport Act, went through the Westminster Parliament. We, had, we asked passengers, what structure do you want to see? How should bus services be operated? 75% uh, of passengers didn't know actually how they actually operated and frankly didn't really care. Uh, basically, at the end of when we asked the passengers, the bus companies in all levels of government, be it national or local government, should work together and deliver the service we actually want, regardless of the structure. And we have, uh, I've sent to the committee and all MSPs, we've prepared a, a ten, point, 10 action points that would fit the existing system, which would fit re-regulation, would fit franchising, would fit partnerships, alliances, quality contracts. That actually puts passengers at the heart of this. Based on our research, what passengers actually want in terms of boosting the role of the driver, driving training, customer care and satisfaction, improving fares and ticketing, ensuring frequency, stability of service, and things about timetable changes, where timetables can change in a moment's notice in the bus industry. Passengers want to be consulted on timetable changes that affects their lives, that affects... When I used to live in a village, it affects... I actually can't get to my job anymore because I've changed the bus service. No, these things will put passengers at the heart of it, regardless of the structure. So make sure these 10 points are in, so that passengers actually get the service they deserve, and it will actually drive up passenger numbers to over 400 million. Uh, just before we move on, can I go back to Mr Sampson? The, the previous uh, Labour Liberal executive, when they legislated for uh, transport, introduced uh, voluntary and statutory bus partnerships. Now, there have been virtually no statutory bus partnerships um, and very comparatively few voluntary ones. Is, is that a structure that, and it, that would be, seem to be a structure where public policy more directly controls how the buses are delivered and could take a lock of the boxes. Have you any views on why they've not been used apart from them creating some administrative buttons for local authorities, which I think is probably the reason, in my view. Now, that was a very long question. Um, Robert, I'm going to let you come back with a, a shorter a very, answer. A very, a very brief. We, we sit in a number of bodies in England, English metropolitan areas, uh, partnerships, alliances, uh, where the passenger voice is central to it. And again, it's... You know, 
whatever structure you devise, make sure passengers have a seat at the table can actually influence the structure. That, that is the key thing. Thank you. I think that that's probably the right place to... Uh, Sheila, I'll bring you in. I'm just going to make a very quick point about bus registration. Local authorities are notified of bus changes and withdrawals 70 days before it happens. And they have, a, I think it's a four-week period in which they can talk to bus companies. Then the following period actually is an opportunity for them to talk to local people. We would like, uh, Mobility and Acts Committee, would like to see equality impact assessments done on any change or withdrawal. And we'd like to see disabled people included in the discussion before it happens. There is a reluctance at the moment for council officers and councillors to actually tell the local people that their bus service is going to be changed because they're going to be under pressure to try and go back to the bus company, offer some money to try and keep it going. And as Robert rightly said, quite a lot of these services involve commuter journeys and people not being able to continue in their jobs, not being able to get to doctors. Um, in some cases. So we need to have a more robust system of informing people of what's happening. Okay, thank you. Um, I've got a second question. I know, and, and I'm, I was going to say a, a, a brief one. That would be yeah. useful. Um, uh, at, at the risk of big answers, the question is very, very simply um, the uh, concessionary travel scheme, which a couple of us are, are uh, hope members of, uh, is being looked at at the moment. Uh, are there any, and this is, has to be brief, uh, things that mustn't happen to it or any things that really should happen to it? Gavin and then Sheila. Well, as, as, as a beneficiary of the scheme, I, I, would, I would hate to see it changed in, in any way particularly. I, I, would, I would be sorry to see the, the lower age range rising as mm. it has done in, in England. Um, but I understand the, 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 the sums involved in, in all of this, but it is uh, a tremendously useful thing for us older people. Uh, it gives us mobility, it helps our health, and it's something that, uh, you know, I, I, I applaud the Scottish Government for, for introducing it and for maintaining it at the, the level it, it is. So I would, I would hate to see any change. Uh, and, and your vested interest is, is, is noted, Sheila. <laughs> I, I also have a vested interest, so I have to admit that. Um, and I too would, would really struggle with any changes because I think what we have at the moment is an excellent, excellent system that enables people to get out and about and it, it is combating loneliness and isolation. So it's really important that we try to keep it as it is. Thank, thank you for that. Um, Robert, do you want to add something briefly to that, or do you think that that's um, just just briefly on on the concession when we survey passengers? It's worth bearing in mind that it's, it's uh, over the last four years we've surveyed over twenty thousand passengers. The free pass holders we don't survey in value for money, obviously, but in overall satisfaction, it's they're far higher than fair pairs, as you would expect. But also. About 49% of the concessionary travel holders we survey say they travel by bus because they don't have any other option. They still, you know, regarding you know, there's still a lifeline service in many ways. You know, some are making you know, leisure journeys, but for about 50% of the people who are entitled to concessionary passes that we survey, it is the only option they still have to travel. So that's worth bearing in mind as an aside. I think that's a very valid point. Uh, Peter. Um, we've been speaking mainly about bus travel. I'm going to move on to rail travel. Um, Scotrail Alliance announced on 30th of March that it commissioned an independent rail expert to produce an improvement plan. So are you satisfied with how Scot the Scotrail Alliance communicate with passengers about planned and unexpected service disruption? And if not, what changes would you like to see introduced? And I would also ask if you... What impact does bus replacement of rail services have on passengers, particularly those with limited mobility? You know, when you're suddenly the, 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 rail, the railway doesn't go and you're on a bus which you didn't expect to be on. So I think may, that's may, mainly you know, for Hussein and, and Sheila, I think, particularly. Hussein. Thank you, um, and thank you for the question. I think uh, largely you know, communication is absolutely pivotal to you know, anyone, but particularly disabled folk, having information about not only what is happening, but any additional steps that may be necessary to allow them to complete their journey. 
If we take the recent winter weather and the, the major disruption that that caused across the country as an example, ScotRail, to be fair, did a lot to communicate using electronic means, social media, email and text messaging for those who were subscribed to that. But we have to bear in mind that there is a sizable proportion of the population that is not digitally connected. And there are also people who may be digitally connected but cannot access the channels through which this information is provided. I've always said what I'd like to see is greater use of mass media, so terrestrial television and radio to communicate messages about what is happening. And also, going back to you know, playing a simple telephone, passenger assist is extremely beneficial to passengers, but we, certainly as a committee and through our experiences, have yet to find a single instance where ScotRail used a telephone to advise somebody who had booked assistance that their service was cancelled, their service was disrupted, or indeed a lot of people have mobile phones these days, to tell them if their journey had been curtailed and there was bus replacement transport. To focus on the bus transport side of things, there is of course the accessibility of vehicles. In many places that's um, not taken into account at all, leading to very long taxi journeys and additional stress and anxiety for passengers. And also, it's not always clear as to where stopping places are for bus services. Sometimes they're not outside the station, and that communication is generally quite patchy. Very often, it's left to the passengers to try and work out where their bus is, which bus is going where. Sometimes buses will skip intermediate stops. So which bus do you get on? How does that whole system work? Thank you. Um, Sheila, you come in and then maybe Robert. I, th I think things have slightly improved because um, on rail services where they're using bus replacements, I think they're generally now trying to use stations that are accessible. I, um, I've in the past been uh, off the train at Pitlochry to use a bus and you have to cross over the, the steps that go over the railway, which is a common thing in Highland. And many people cannot do that and some stations there is actually no ac access to the other, um, other platform. So I think that there has to be an awareness that when people are par um, travelling, they may not have disclosed that they're disabled, but they may have mobility problems, and they may have problems that, as Hussain said earlier on, about hidden disabilities that actually need them to be told quite clearly what's happening. And I think that that's something that we need to improve on. Thank you. Uh, Robert, and then I'll come back to Peter for, for another yeah. question. Yeah, on the particular issue of performance, we met with uh, Nick Donovan, who, who compiled the report on improving performance. We went through the passenger issues. What we found with the report is, is detailed. It gives you 20 action points to actually work upon, but th there's no silver bullet, basically, to actually improve performance. It's actually focusing on the assets and, and the day job and getting those things right to actually improve the main driver of satisfaction for passengers, which is train reliability. Thank you. You're not, you're not really uh, confident that the, the Nick Donovan piece of work is going to help? I, th I think it will help. It will give, it will give a focus. Uh, but you know, you know, what we find and what ScotRail are finding, uh, you know, we, we do the national passengers, the national rail passengers, so it gives you overall satisfaction. But if you actually break that down, as we did for passengers in Strathclyde, young passengers under the age of 25, you know, satisfied with ticket buying facilities, satisfied with the station environment, satisfied with interaction with staff, satisfied with train cleanliness, overall satisfaction, fairly dissatisfied. Why? My train was five minutes late getting into Glasgow Central. It has a major impact. So I'm no ScotRail and the Alliance know they have to focus on performance and actually crack that to actually get overall satisfaction because there's a clear correlation. Now, you can have everything else right, but if my train's late and I'm late for my, my work, my boss might not be understanding. So there's a clear correlation. And, and fo the report focuses on the day tasks that need to be get that management attention to actually improve performance back up to over 90 plus percent. John, do you want to come in briefly? Yeah, yeah, it was, uh, thank you, Convener. So a very brief question to, to, to Sheila, um, um, and that is in relation to the, the difficulties you talked about on the train for people with mobility issues. Would you be of the view, as I am, that the 
safety critical second person on the tree in the guard on the train is a vital <coughs> aid. Absolutely, oh, absolutely, they're very, very important. And um, I found out recently that quite a lot of them are much more customer focused than they used to be. And they are very, very good at sussing out if somebody actually needs a little bit of help. I think that's a, a, a plus point for ScotRail. I think it's really good that they've done that. Um, and I, definitely, I would hate to see the second person on the, the train. We, we actually have incidents where people, some of our committee have been going places to view things. Fortunately, at Waverley, they were told not to get on the train. They, one of them was in a wheelchair because there was no assistant on the train to use the ramp to get them off at the station they wanted to get off at. So that's a key issue that we have on one-man trains that we don't, we might not, especially on unmanned stations, there won't be somebody there to deploy the ramp. Okay, thank you very much. Peter, you've got a follow-up question, then we're going to move on to Jamie Green. Yeah, I mean, consumer group, which has recently raised concerns about how ScotRail deals with passenger compensation claims during periods of disruption. Do you share these concerns? And if so, what changes would you like to see uh, made to the compensation arrangements? Who'd like to, to go on that? And I'm going to ask you all to be as brief as possible because I see it. Robert. The new franchise agreement has delayed repay. There's a, there's a threshold. But it's actually, when we, we actually researched that with passengers, about 50% of passengers don't actually claim for the compensation they're actually entitled to. And it's about building up trust and improving the customer experience between ScotRail and the passengers. When the train is late, why not make an announcement asking, telling passengers that are entitled to compensation, remind to, remind to actually put in a form or various mechanisms how actually to get the compensation. Staff at the barriers can actually engage with passengers and say, you're entitled to compensation when actually improve trust between the operator and the passenger. It's got to be better communication than what passengers are actually entitled to. And that just doesn't apply with ScotRail. It applies equally to cross-border train operators as well. I, I, I noticed you all nodding um, in agreement. Hussein, I'll bring you in and then I'm going to move on to the next question. Just, just a very short operational point with regard to uh, the, the threshold for delay and repay. How do you know what time your train's actually arrived at the station? Is that the time at which the train physically stops? Or is that the time at which you get off onto the platform? That's never been made clear, certainly to me as a passenger in the last seven years of traveling. And that has the potential for many people to put in claims which are either not valid or indeed the opposite way around. So, you know, this issue of communication and passenger ignoring what to do, when to do it, how to do it, and what happens once they've submitted the claim really needs to be looked into to make sure that people are doing things correctly and getting what they deserve. Well, hopefully Scott Rail are listening to this uh, broadcast and, and will be reading the transcript and will come up with an answer to that, but I think it's a very valid point. Jamie. Thank you, Convener, and good morning. Um, moving on to some of the other issues, uh, which I think the Donovan report flagged, um, which uh, seem to be of concern to commuters, um, two specific issues. One is overcrowding on trains. Uh, I think it's probably better in some areas and worse in others, especially in areas where there have been delays to the delivery of new services or reduction in the amount of carriages on, on a specific service. Is it your impression that overcrowding has got better or worse or stayed the same? Who'd like to lead off on that? Um, Robert, perhaps. Um, what, one of the, the problems is uh, there's going to be more capacity on the rail network, uh, but uh, introduction of class 385s, introduction of the new HSTs, but one of the, the bugbears for passengers is that this was actually announced in 2014 when the franchise actually changed hands and four years later we're still sitting here waiting on the new trains. Uh, when we do research for passengers, passenger priorities, one of their top priorities is always being able to get a seat on the train. That is a, and particular routes, particularly at commuter times, morning and evening peaks, it is a problem. But there is going to be an uplift in capacity of between 25 and 50% extra seats on some routes, if not more, that will <coughs> actually alleviate those problems. But no, we want the trains as soon as possible to actually do that and actually generate passenger growth. Mm -hmm. 
Jamie, do you have a follow-up to that? Um, uh, yes, I mean, uh, one of the other issues that frequently comes up is the issue of um, stop skipping. <clears throat> uh, on services, uh, one of the key recommendations of, of Donovan was actually this should be uh, stopped uh, unless absolutely necessary, and I think there was a promise made by Escort Rail to that very effect. But can you explain to me um, perhaps uh, your view on whether you, you think this is improving? Uh, do you, do you, how much confidence do you have in the promises that it will be eliminated? Um, or, or any other views on that particular practice? Robert. Uh, we've had meetings with Scott Rail on the process of skip stopping. <coughs> uh, and we're confident that that will get better and hopefully stop entirely. You know, passengers want the timetable to be delivered in its entirety. One of the problems with skip stopping that's happened on occasion is if you're standing at the station and you get advised in advance, it's frustrating, but you can cope with that. If you're actually oh, sitting yes. on the train and the announcement is it's missing your stop, oh, oh passengers will be incandescent. And rightly so, but it's up to the rail industry to actually deliver the timetable in its entirety, so that all stations are served. Uh, uh, that leads probably nicely into the final question, which is uh, around the performance improvement program, which is coming out of the the, uh, the, 20, the key twenty recommendations from uh, Donovan's review. Um, I think Robert, you said that they're all they're all very welcome yeah. improvements. But it's not a magic bullet. So what is the magic bullet then? If, if, if this won't do it, and the previous 249 point plan didn't do it, you know where are we heading in, in terms of the industry uh, in, on improving uh, the service to, to passengers? What, what is what is the magic uh, <laughs> solution then? And that, Robert, I would encourage you to to respond, the, the but, but but shortly. If yeah, I may. The, the, the magic bullet is that the plan has been agreed and implemented is watching the monthly reporting figures, the moving annual average to actually see improvement. You know, we have to give the plan six to nine months to actually, to actually bear fruition, to actually see improvement along each period so that performance goes back up into the, the mid-90%. There is no magic bullet. It's actually working hard on the day job to actually deliver the 20-point pl plan in its entirety. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Perfect. Uh, the next question is from Colin and uh, Sheila and Hussein will be the main recipients, I suspect, for the, these questions. Colin. Th thank you very much indeed, uh, convener. It very much uh, will be because this is regarding some of the recommendations in the Motability and Access Committee's annual report for 2016-17. For the, the report highlighted a number of concerns about accessibility to and from some of the, the recently remodelled stations, such as Haymarket and, and the, the taxi ranks at, at Waverley, for example. How might these issues have been avoided, uh, and what do you think the lessons are that can be learned for future projects? I'm going to let Hussein come in first. I think a key concept, and as a committee we are now pushing this where we can, is that accessibility should be a consideration at the conceptual stage for any project before any work commences and before the plan is even signed off. What we are finding, especially with some of the retrofits that are now going on, is because accessibility has been an afterthought or has been something which has not been fully consulted with stakeholders, there is then a lot of investment going into remodeling, having to redo things to make things compliant, to make things accessible. And that is then causing additional disruption, additional anxiety and stress for passengers. So accessibility is something that should be integral to every project and something that starts at day one rather than at the point where the plan is implemented. Thank you. Sheila? Uh, I would really like to... You know, Haymarket is a very good example because Max were very involved with that. We've moved away from being involved in specific stations now because we simply just don't have the time to do it. Um, the big issue at Haymarket is actually where the taxi ranks are. Um, and I think that's going to be an issue at all stations. Um, and actually, a misunderstanding about how easy it is for 
blind people or people with a mobility issue to get to from the station to the taxi rank. And if it's a distance, that's going to be a very big barrier for them. Passenger assist happen, helps to the door of the station. Technically, they're not allowed to go beyond that. So <laughs> they, some of them are very, very good at helping people to get to a taxi rank. But technically, at Haymarket, they're not allowed to cross the road and take them down to the, the taxi rank. And that's a big issue because of the distance from the station. Thank you. John, you want to come in briefly and then yeah. I'll come back to Colin. Uh, thank you, Kavina. Uh, Sheila, in, in relation to that, and we would understand that, you know, ideally um, everyone would work together to, to ensure that happens. There are, there are perhaps other issues if you're involved in the local authority or the, the, the roads network. I wonder, in relation to a new station, for instance, like Forest, do you feel that there was the necessary consultation and um, provision put in place there? Because it certainly seemed to me that that was the case. I would agree. I, I was involved in the consultation on forests through other, or not on to do with Max, but on another panel I was on. And it's crucially important that local people are involved all the way through. Okay. Thank you very much. Colin, do you want to come back briefly? Uh, just, I was keen, we've talked about accessibility to, to the stations themselves. Are there any other issues that, that Max have related to, to rail travel and accessibility? I know the report talked about issues around concessionary travel and. Um, on-chain assistant, uh, the particular concerns you have? There are a number of very specific issues that have come up recently. One of them is the um, plus ones for blind people um, and the difficulty of booking tickets because the, the person with the card can actually go up to the barrier and get through, but if they have to have a companion with them, a ticket has to be bought for the companion. It's, it's very much based on local authority concessionary fare schemes and there is a difference across the country. So a standardisation of that nationwide would be, would be very useful. Thank, thank you. And unless there's any other points on that, I, I think that, that, that's a natural conclusion. If I could just say at this stage that uh, Scott Rail are due to come in on, in front of the committee on the 9th of May, how appropriate is that, and the minister on the 16th of May. So a lot of the points I'm sure that have been raised here today will be picked up by the committee members at those meetings. So it's been an extremely useful meeting for us this morning. I'd like to thank the witnesses uh, for the evidence that they've given to the committee. And I'd also like to thank for the viewers that are on Facebook who've been watching this uh, for, the, for their attendance. And I'm now briefly going to suspend the meeting to allow the witnesses to change. Thank you.
Thank you. Uh, I'd now like to reconvene the meeting and move on to agenda item three, which is salmon farming in Scotland. Um, before I, well, I'd like to welcome Donald Cameron as the reporter for the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee uh, on the salmon farming in Scotland inquiry. And I'd like to ask members if they'd like to declare any interest. I'm going to start that off by declaring an interest in a wild salmon fishery, a full declaration I gave at the beginning of the inquiry. Uh, would anyone else? Uh, Donald. I'd also like to uh, repeat the declaration of interest I made on the 5th of March in relation to both uh, fish farm and um, a wild fishery. Thank you. This is our fourth evidence session on the committee's salmon farming in Scotland inquiry. Can I point out two things? First of all, we had a very useful session last night uh, on a video conference with the Agriculture Stewardship Council, who uh, the Brief notes from that meeting will be made available and put on the website. It was an extremely informative meeting uh, which the committee members took part in. And I'd also like to actually point out a disappointing fact. Uh, the committee has not been able yet to identify any retailers of product in Scotland who are prepared to come before the committee in person to give evidence. I'm told that they are giving ev written evidence. I think it's disappointing. Um, that they are not coming to the committee in person to, despite invitations to do so. So having made that point, uh, the committee will now take evidence today from bodies with an interest in the development of farm salmon sector. And I'd like to welcome James Withers, the Chief Executive of Scotland Food and Drink. I'd like to welcome Elaine Jemison, the Head of Food and Drink, Highlands and Islands Enterprise, and Heather Jones, the Chief Executive of Scottish Aquaculture Innovation Centre. Um, and the first question today will be from John Finney. John. Um, thank you, Convener. I, and and uh, I share your, your view about the retailers. And um, these are retailers who I've no doubt will quote um, in Good Morning Panel members a phrase that's, that's in their papers here, and that is pristine waters in the visually dramatic Highlands and Island loch settings. Um, how important is Scotland's natural environment to the market for Scottish farm salmon, please? Who'd like to head off on that? James, looks like you're, you're ready to go on that one. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's critically important, and not just to the agriculture industry, but to all of Scotland's brand. Um, certainly when we look at the market here, which is growing, and the market that is growing overseas, a large part of that is about Scotland's broader provenance story. There's a number of parts to that. It's about a mixture of heritage and tradition, but it's also about innovation, it's about family businesses, but it's absolutely about environmental integrity as well. And I think that, you know, the, the only strong future will be for our aquaculture industry is embracing world-class standards of, of environmental stewardship, animal welfare and, and husbandry. And if we don't do that, we'll not keep building the brand that has been over the last years, which has, you know, driven a doubling of food exports over the last 10 years from Scotland. Heather. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think it's important to remember the context in which um, Scottish salmon is going to the global market. Compared to other farm species, um, Ecuadorian shrimp, um, Vietnamese pangasius, Chinese um, carp, the sea bass and sea bream from the Mediterranean, the, the quality of the provenance and the, the standards of environmental monitoring in Scotland are very, very high and they're widely regarded by a number of other countries, including very developed countries, as the best in the world. So the New Zealand government wrote a comparative study on um, environmental quality standards and they held up the Scottish regulatory system as one of the best. John, do you want to come back? Yes, well, just to, to, to look at a very negative there, and then what, what would the consequences be of, of a failure to, to retain that, that uh, position? Heather, do you want of, to, of, of, of quality change. that is connected with environment. Yeah, from, from, a, uh, from a customer point of view, you know, we're, we're dealing with a customer base, and it's different in different countries. But for most of the countries that, that that we're looking at as markets and our home market here, who are increasingly environmental uh, conscious, they want to understand the regulatory systems that sit behind it. They're not going to go into the detail, but they want to have faith that we're operating through production systems that, that work in harmony with the environment and enhance it where possible. So um, Scotland's growth in food and drink has been a large part about reputation. It's been about building that, that, that reputation and building that story as well as the quality of the products themselves. So anything that, that um, you know, had a detrimental impact on that would be, you know, would be hugely damaging. And I think 
you know, as Heather alludes there, we've got a, an agriculture industry at the moment where perceptions of that, of that product, uh, both the quality and the standards of production, are extremely high. John, I'm going to bring in John Mason very briefly on, on that and then maybe come back to you. John, yes, John. I, I was interested uh, by Heather Jones' comment just now that Scotland's reputation is very good because uh, last night we had a video link with the ACS. Is that ASC. Correct? ASC, sorry, I've got the letters wrong. <laughs> and they uh, really felt that Scotland was pretty poor in comparison to, say, Norway. Uh, we'll come on to lice later, but uh, the standards, and they felt Scotland was relying on things like, you know, we've got a beautiful visual climate, as, the, as that wording says, but the reality is we're not as strict as South American countries, Canada, Norway, etc. That was their view. Uh, I'm certainly very surprised to hear that they think that the Chilean um, husbandry standards are higher than Scotland. I mean, Scotland is widely regarded as one of the most tightly regulated um, places in the world for salmon production and certainly in, in relation to other species salmon is literally the king of fish in terms of the way in which uh, it's monitored it's researched um, and that the environmental impact is is a recognized factor that's taken has that been account. approved by some third party internationally or is that just our opinion in scotland uh, as I said, it's, it's certainly the opinion of a report written by the New Zealand government where they looked at comparative systems and thought that the Scottish system was one of the strongest. I mean, different systems have different strengths, but I have, I, I have seen little evidence in reality to suggest that Scotland is in a poor place. I, I, I think the point that, that was being made by the ASC last night was that some of the companies have got uh, certification through their scheme. In, in other countries such as Norway and Chile, the, the very same companies that operate in Scotland, but there were no farms in Scotland that had the certification um, that they have for other farms across the world. I think that's the point that was being made. Um, Heather, do you want to come back on that? I suppose just to observe that there are a number of different certification schemes. The certification bodies actually trade and market as a way of, of creating value for themselves and for their products. I think what we can say is that, and, and I'll pick up your point about the retailers with some of the contacts that, that we have in our um, industry consortium, but I think the point I would make is that the UK retail market sets very, very high standards. You think about M&S's Plan A, and basically all the major retailers specify um, fish health quality, water quality, um, stocking density, and all these other things. And, and actually, it's then the, the Whole Foods in the US and the German retailers that are starting to copy what's been established in the UK market. So I think you know, James is right to say that the, the standards of what consumers get here is, is very high. Uh, John, do you want to come back? Uh, Peter's got a question yeah. as well. So. Yes, yeah. uh, th thank you, Peter. Uh, perhaps for Elaine there, the, the importance of, for the rural economy of this. Um, I, and and I, I, I'm, I'm sure that the providence of, of, of produce is important um, across the range, but specifically with regard to the issue we're looking at here, do Highlands Islands Enterprise have a view about the issues we've just been discussing? We look for sustainable growth across all of our sectors, the key sectors in Scotland, including, for example, tourism and food and drink. And I would say we look to the regulatory bodies and, and Heather and our friends in, in the science and academic community uh, to lead the scientific work around in positive environmental management and positive environmental stewardship. And from the point of view of Highlands and Islands Enterprise, we support businesses to be innovative in the practices that they have to have very positive outcomes. Um, I think if we look at tourism, for example, that is another sector that relies very heavily on our natural environment. We have seen that both the aquaculture sector, fin farm, fin farming in particular, and the tourism sector have both been able to grow significantly over recent years. So um, I, whilst I appreciate environmental impacts are not all aesthetic, um, there are no perceived impacts by people who are appreciating our assets from that point of view. Okay, thank you. Um, sorry, Peter, I'm not going to bring you in because I did actually say I'd bring Stuart in first. So, so a correction there. Stuart and then Peter. Uh, a comparatively small point, I think, purely for Heather Jones. Um, in terms of regulation, it's been argued that Chile has better regulations than Scotland, I think, by some. But, and the big but is, 
that the monitoring and implementation of them is extremely poor. In other words, the regulation is not, and I'm inviting you to agree, and in particular we've seen in Chile, the industry has been shut down on several occasions for a period of time because of the poor <coughs> monitoring and management of health issues, even though a theoretical look at the regulations mm. it would tell you a very different story. So is it fair to say we've got to look at the outcome that come from it rather than simply what might be in the legal framework. Absolutely, uh, Mr. Stevens, I think that's a very good point. Um, Chile has had multiple major health challenges which have caused hundreds of thousands of fish losses because they've allowed untrammeled growth, high intensity, um, high density growth, and that's put pressure on the fish stocks which causes disease challenge and health risk, and as a result, all the fish die. So, in fact, a lot of the Norwegian multinationals have been disinvesting from Chile because they're just losing money because actually the regulatory system doesn't work successfully. So, in order for companies to have confidence to invest in Scotland, they need to know that a regulatory system will be stable uh, and will be um, steady and will be kind of quantified. So, giving some certainty around the system that we have, I think, will can incentivise or disincentivise uh, foreign international direct investment. Thank you. Peter? Yeah, I was keen to uh, explore a wee bit more about how the industry is certified in, in, in Scotland, because we heard, as we heard last night, the ESC doesn't certify any fish farms, as, as far as we're aware, in Scotland. So what, do, what drives the certification system here? Is it driven by retailers? Is that, is that the, the system that we have here? James, um, do you want to come in? or? Heather, I'll, I'll start a little bit. I'm not an expert on certification, food certification systems. Um, I do know that the Scottish Salmon Producers Organisation has an independent company called Acura, who are headquartered in Edinburgh, that are one of the major certification bodies for marine um, standards for um, capture fisheries and for other food production and for salmon production. Um, I also know that each of the retailers specifies in their contracts to their suppliers minimum standards that have to be applied around um, withdrawal times from medicines, stocking density, um, the way in which the fish are brought to market. So actually the, the consumer pressure creates as much demand on producers as any other, and that's if effectively funneled through the retailers. Yeah, there's very, very little I can add to that, and it's a cure that, that um, obviously deliver a lot of the quality assurance schemes when we're talking about uh, land farming. So the Scotch beef quality assurance scheme, Scotch lamb, especially at Port Acura, deliver a lot of the quality assurance there. So there's some parallels between farming the land and farming the seas from that point of view. But I mean, to emphasize a point, as a committee, we're well aware, um, and I suppose it's a shame the retailers might not be sat in front of you to make this point, but the demands that they have um, in terms of regulation are complex, uh, they're uh, ever-changing, um, and, I, and certainly, uh, in most cases, go well beyond the legal minimum. Peter, do you want to come back? Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to hear that. I mean, I do know that the retailers are pretty strict in, in, in all their supply chains. They always are. It doesn't matter whether it's beef, lamb, pork, or salmon, I would imagine. But we, it was just we weren't clear what that process looked like or how, how it was driven. So a wee bit more on that would be actually useful, I think, for the, for the committee. Yeah, and I think maybe SSPO, who I'm not sure if they've given evidence yet, but from those directly involved in, in you know, the industry in both production and processing would be the best place to, to answer that. But I know there are, it's the same with um, you know, wild catch fishing between MSC, MCS, you know, there's a whole variety of certification schemes that, that, um, that exist out there. Okay, Good. thank you. Thank I think we'll move on to the next question. Stuart. Uh, thank you. Just an observation, I think La Belle Rouge if the French endorse something, it's got to be good. <laughs> now, that might not be based on reality, based on perception, but uh, no comment. Um, the, um, the, the issue that uh, Heather Jones raised uh, in relation to Chile is one I want to develop on. In other words, that uh, if you get your expansion too fast and you don't have appropriate regulatory and oversight, uh, you're, you're, you're in difficulty. Uh, so are we in a position where the environmental interaction between fish farming uh, and uh, these pristine waters uh, is one that we need to manage more tightly as we expand the industry or expect it? And that's really for everybody. Um, 
who wants to start off on that? Um, you're all looking at each other. Um, so that means that I get to nominate. Uh, James, you can start, and we'll work from, from to your right after that. So the question, Stuart, is really about regulation, whether the, the, the interaction of regulation bodies on the industry itself needs tightening. Is that... I think fair summary. That would be. Um, so I suppose, um, and as I say, I, I, I sit here as a kind of outside. Sorry, just to be clear. Sorry, Stuart. particularly in the context of the proposed expansion. Okay. Yes. So I, I think that's going to be critically important because you know we've got an industry that's in, in production terms is is relatively static. Um, when I started in, in, in this role at Scotland Food and Drink six years ago, Scotland had about 11 or 12 percent of the world's market share in Atlantic Farm Salmon. We're now down to about seven. Uh, and I'm concerned about, and, and as demand rises, that, that we wouldn't be able to capitalise on that opportunity in Scotland. But growth needs um, carefully managed. <coughs> uh, you know, as, as the question from Mr Finney was initially, you know, that our, our environmental integrity and our pristine waters are a key asset. Um, so how we um, grow the industry in value terms, actually, as much as volume terms, I think, um, and how we do that collectively with environmental agencies will be critical. My hope lies, I have to say, is that if you'd asked me that question, um, you know, even 18 months ago, I'd have said, I'm not sure we have good enough relationships between the industry itself and the regulatory bodies, both from a um, from a day-to-day -day operational point of view, but actually in terms of proactively managing that growth. I think there's been a real sea change from that point of view. There's an industry leadership group that's now established. We have the senior representatives from SEPA, from Marine Scotland, from uh, SNH, um, who are involved around that uh, table on managing that growth uh, agenda. So I think the relationships are stronger now, and I think the kind of collaboration and partnership, which has been marked, for example, in, I think, the Scotch whisky industry, in terms of its environmental performance, could now be mirrored in, in the agriculture industry. So I'm, I'm much more hopeful that that kind of partnership and collaboration can underpin a growth journey over the next few years, and one that's done sustainably. Uh, just before we move on, you talked about that forum where there are quite a lot of people involved in regulation. Are there too many bodies for the regulation to be effective? Because I think there is some evidence that the committee has received that leads us to that position. I'm very happy to let you answer that, Stuart. You're going to have to make your peace with Mr. Rumbles later because you've oh, asked sorry. his question. I, I do beg uh, James. Uh, I'd be very happy to sorry. let Heather uh, answer that question, to be honest with you. I think it probably has a better handle on. Uh, I mean, much like many oh, yes, areas yeah. of, of Scottish industry and regulation, there are a number of different bodies. I think their remits actually are, are quite clear and are quite distinct. But I might, Heather, you might be better place to comment. If that's okay? Okay. We're going to uh, Elaine and then Heather. Thank you. I would say that aquaculture, in terms of, of regulation, like any other sector in Scotland, when you, you look at growth, it has to be sustainable and it has to be well managed. And aquaculture is no different from other sectors, and in fact, maybe ahead of other sectors, in that the industry, their partners um, in the public sector and, and their wider stakeholder partners are quite cognizant of some of the challenges that they face, and I think that's very important. Um, I think, as James has described, the Aquaculture Industry Leadership Group um, is a very powerful group of people who are very joined up, who are very open and very collaborative in their thinking, and I think collaboration is absolutely key. I think at a more tactical and operational level, when we look at supporting the industry to grow, we very much now in Scotland have a Team Scotland approach, which sees industry working very much um, as a critical friend who both challenges and supports businesses and the sector to grow on multiple aspects, using that opulent synergy of knowledge that we bring to the table, be it through economic development agencies, in the innovation and academic community, and through the regulators. And I think there are some very good examples of, of the integrated approach between regulators, which I would defer to Heather to give you more detail on uh, in, in places where I live, for example, in the islands, where we see regulators and local authorities working very well. Heather, and then I'm going to bring in Mike to uh, ask some of the other questions he might have on this. So I suppose just to answer the question, have we got too many regulatory bodies and is it confused? My answer to that would be um, no, and that's because each body has a specific role, and as long as it sticks to having a uh, opinion and evidence on its area of expertise, then it's quite clear what that role is. So, for example, the Crown Estate is the landlord, so you pay them a rent to, um, to anchor your nets to the seabed, and that's, that's effectively 
the role. Um, SNH's role is to protect and preserve species and habitats under under threat or on, on European protected lists. So that's about impacts on, on other environments. Um, Marine Scotland's role is specifically about the health and welfare and the husbandry of the fish. So in the same way that the, the, the um, sort of rural land animal uh, chief vet would have responsibilities around how are, how are animals cared for, um, what kinds of medical treatments can you give them, how do you make sure that they flourish. So that's the responsibility of Marine Scotland Science. And then finally, SEPA is responsible for what is the impact on the environment on the seabed and the water column in terms of um, either uh, waste deposits or any other um, <coughs> effluents into the system, which would be just the same as agricultural systems where you're growing cows and sheep and, and, uh, and you have effluent and you have treatments that then go into the environment. Mike, would you like to come Th in now? Thank you, Convener. Um, your evidence today is very welcome, but it, it is in contradiction to a lot of the other evidence that we've received, so it's very interesting to, to hear it because there has been severe criticism of the uh, regulatory bodies involved in all of this process. So if I can just focus on something perhaps uh, the evidence given to us from the Highland Council uh, gave us when we asked them this. Um, applica planning applications, to give you an example, pl planning applications for, win for um, fish farms um, are taken on an individual basis. They have to be. Uh, you know, a, a developer comes along, puts an application in, and Highland Councils, for instance, has to deal with that specific application. So what I'm trying to, and when we put that evidence to Highland Council, they said actually it would be a good thing if there was a, more of a strategic view of the whole process of fish farming in, uh, in Highland region. And um, so they were quite clear that they, they thought that would be a, a very uh, effective way of dealing, with, rather than dealing with piecemeal as the law stands at the moment. So do you think that my question really is going on, what are the main problems with the planning process for fish farming in, from your perspective? Are there any? Who'd, who'd like to head off on that? You're all looking. If, if none of you jump forward, it means that, that, that I have to find a volunteer, James. Yeah, so I, I suppose what I would say um, is that, you know, SSPO would be the, the uh, my go-to people in terms of commenting on the planning process. What I would say is I think that... Um, a more strategic overview um, and framework for how we grow this sector on a national basis would be very helpful. Uh, from, from my point of view, at a, at a local planning level, individual planning applications are taken on, on their individual basis, and I understand that. Um, I think they are subject to significant tests and environmental uh, assessments, and I think there are still applications that, that run into real difficulty despite having you know, approval from CEPA, SNH, and all yeah. the regulatory authorities. Um, the chief planner sits around the, the industry leadership group table that, that I mentioned, and I think if we could get into a position where you know, there's a, the industry has developed a strategic framework for how it wants to go forward, mm -hmm. if we could have a planning system that could, on a national basis, demonstrate how it could support that development with all the checks and balances the planning system would need, I think it would make it easy for the industry to think about how it invests in future and how it grows going forward. Because I think, and I, I expect that's not just an issue for the agriculture industry, I think that's, mm -hmm. a, that's a, probably a comment on the planning system um, per se, but I'm, I'm not sure the planning system is fully functional. Um, my my com committee colleagues seem to be making me want to work for my living by, by jumping around the questions which they'd indicated they wanted to ask, because that then will bring John Finney in with, with some of his questions. But I mean, Elaine, do you want to answer on planning? And then I'd like to bring John, John Finney in on some of the planning issues, and then maybe try and come back to, to the issue of the status quo, which is where we started, if I can. So, Elaine, do you want to, to come in on the planning aspect of it? Yes, well, I should say from an economic and community development agency, I'm not an expert in planning. But um, I agree with the comments that Heather in particular has made, but there are some, some good examples, I think, that we could look at where the regulators work effectively together and, and planning is, is effective. So in Shetland, for example, they have a very um, good integrated approach where they, they balance a broad range of issues um, that are both about the environment, they are about the businesses, and they are about, about the community. But I think at the heart of planning, the issue has to be around the sustainable growth. And the conversation needs to be between the public sector very much and the private sector as well to look at what 
uh, true sustainable growth will look like into the future and to have some clear direction and some clear vision over the medium to long term. Uh, John Finney, would you like to pose yeah, it? Um, maybe just roll a few issues together around this particular point then, uh, Convener, Thank you. and that is uh, perhaps the role that the local development plan should play in all of this. Um, who should lead? Um, because, uh, you know, clearly we want communities involved as well. And whether this should be looked at in splendid isolation or, or integrated as part of other reforms, because Heather, you, you, if I noted you correctly, talked about the distinct role that everyone has. So if this is a, a, a high level vision, how is that all wrapped together so that, for instance, local people aren't disenfranchised and uh, there is open and transparency uh, about the whole process, please? Heather. I suppose I was quite surprised to see that the planner from Highland Council suggesting that a kind of macro body could make decisions because it seems to me the essence of local democracy that decisions are taken as close to uh, the communities as possible. Um, I, th I think what I would say is on, if we t take Shetland as an example, um, there was a disease outbreak there in 2009 called infectious salmon anemia, which is another disease that has devastated Chile. And since that time, uh, the number of sites that is, are being actively farmed has been significantly reduced. So the productivity may be still the same, but the, the companies have rationalised where they're putting the fish and they've changed the dynamics of that and the, and the density of it so that actually in Scotland there are probably 300 um, planning permission sites, but only 200 of them are actually used. And I think what I'm, the point I'm making here is that the industry becomes self-regulating, as does the environment, in that if you have too many sites and you farm them too intensively, you will get disease outbreak. Therefore, if you pick and choose, and, and to come back to the question about expansion, how do you expand efficiently? Well, one thing is you reduce your losses. Another thing is that you optimise the production in your existing sites. Another thing is that you see if you can expand the size of existing sites. And then the fourth thing is you might develop new sites. And these are all things that the Norwegian government has done in the last 15 years. So when people talk about Scotland being in a perilous position just now, actually our growth is about the same as it was, our volume of tonnage, 160,000 tonnes, is about the same as it was 15 years ago. Norway's gone from about that number to 1.2 million tonnes. So, okay, they've got a bigger coastline. But coming back to the planning question, in Norway, the local authorities and local communities get a dividend from the investment of the companies. But there's also a strategic national plan that the government approves in their parliament that says, we would like to see our industry grow by five times by 2050, which is their, their espoused goal. And we would like to see, they have, a, they have a, a deliberate policy of encouraging expansion in areas of low population. So in the north of Norway, they say we, we're going to issue more licenses in these regions because we want to keep communities active there. And I think that's kind of one of the points that, that is relevant to, to Shetland and the West Niles and Orkney, that without aquaculture jobs, some of these communities wouldn't be able to keep existing. I'm going to bring briefly the uh, Gail Ross Deputy Convener in and then come back to you, John Finney. Uh, Gail. Um, thank you, Convener. Good morning, panel. You spoke about Norway's coastline. But actually, we have a lot of coastline that we're not using currently for fish farms, specifically in the north and the east. Um, if we were able to expand all the way around our coastline, do you think that would have a positive impact on, on what we're trying to do? Because at the moment, everything's concentrated in the west. Heather, I'm going to let you answer that. I, uh, I think there's a very clear and, and wise reason why um, there isn't fish farming on the East Coast. And it's almost a, a bit like in, in Iceland, they have farming areas and they have no farming areas. And Scotland has farming areas and it has no farming areas. 90% of our wild salmon stocks and our um, productive wild rivers, so the Tay, the, tea, the Tweed, um, the Dee, the Dawn, they all filter into the North Sea. They are all very productive because they have a much larger catch river catchment <coughs> area. Um, and so the risk would be if you were to um, change the balance at the moment, you've got effectively protection for all of your, west, your East Coast fisheries because there are no fish farms there. Um, so, so that's one factor. The other factor, one of the reasons that um, fish farms are located in the West Coast and the West Coast of Norway is that they they look for sheltered locations, and in general, the North Sea is less sheltered than sea lochs on the West Coast. 
And that's partly about um, caring for your fish, but it's also the same thing about putting humans that work for your companies out into the North Sea um, into very exposed, hostile environments that companies have a welfare responsibility to their employees as well as to the, the food production system. John, come back to you. Thank you. I, I wonder, just to, to push on the planning issue, um, there was talk of ma macro policy and, and local democracy, and sometimes it's very good to have attention, attention's focused minds. If I, if I, I reach a, um, an extract from the Scottish Aquaculture, a view towards 2030, it states, and I quote, regulations and planning should move to a more proactive, to be, to, sorry, regulations and planning um, move to to more proactive in support. I don't think this is good English one way or another, but I might. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, maybe, it's maybe not me after all. <laughs> John, why don't you make it into good English and get the point across? <laughs> okay. The, the suggestion is that regulations planning should move to be more proactive in supporting good growth rather than, and this I think is the telling phrase, rather than passively enforcing standards. Well, if we're having standards, surely it's vital they're enforced. Um, are we getting the balance right between decision making at local level where there seems to be a lot of pressure um, um, on local authorities to play their part in contributing to this target? Is there undue pressure? Heather. I, I suppose I hadn't interpreted the phrase passive to mean that the regulations weren't being enforced. Um, all regulations in Scotland are enforced. So I think what that, the point of that phrase in that document is saying, if we want to grow the industry, it will only happen if we actively do something to encourage it to happen. If we don't, it will just be the status quo. And as I said before, um, in terms of global markets, um, demand is increasing. So people in, in Dubai and in China and in the US are wanting to, to buy salmon full stop, including Scottish salmon. Production has doubled or tripled in Norway, it's doubled or tripled in Chile, it's increasing vastly in Canada, it's growing at 10% a year in Faroes, it's flat in Scotland. So Scotland is not taking any of that global market opportunity. And, and it's, a, it's a judgment for the people of Scotland whether we want it to or not, but the industry certainly feels that there's an opportunity to reinvest in the communities of Scotland and reinvest in... Um, the opportunity of the coastline of Scotland, because there are very few countries of the world that have the right climatic conditions to grow salmon, and Scotland happens to be one of them. Uh, John, I'm going to let you come back with a follow-up and then move Thank to Gary. I, I just wonder, that, that repeated list, uh, Heather, if, if that could be viewed as heaping some pressure on local planners, who already feel under pressure, because as someone who represents, a, a, um, as a number of people here do, rural areas, of course we want employment in rural areas, mm -hmm. but we want the environment protected as well, and we, we want the highest standards of uh, you know, um, welfare for, for, for creatures as well. So there's a lot to be done there. Um, do you think that this is excessive pressure is uh, being applied to local authorities? I'm, I'm not, in a, not in a position to, to know that. Are you applying pressure then? Not, not in the slightest. Our role is to support um, investment in research. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to move on, if I may, to, to Gail, and then I'll try and bring us back on track. <clears throat> where we start, where we left from. So, Gail. Um, thanks. I, I, I don't know if you're going to be able to answer this question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, and it's something that we haven't really touched on in all of our evidence sessions. And Heather, you mentioned global markets and um, specifically um, the US. But how are we going to continue to expand into American markets if we keep shooting seals? Because I know that that's something that they're not very keen on. Who'd like to... Heather, is that you? I suspect it's me, yes. <laughs> um, yes, the US market's planning to bring in new regulations in 2022, and every salmon-producing company will have to adhere to that, whether it's um, Chile, where they have sea lions, which are much bigger and much more aggressive at attacking um, fishing cages than, than Scotland, or whether it's Norway, where, as you know, um, shooting is a national sport. Um, Yes, there are issues around how do you protect the stocks of, of your fish in the same way that, that farmers would have the same issue about um, the risk of attacks of their sheep by, um, in, in my case, family Labrador. Um, we recognise that if you're a farmer, you have a right to protect your stock which you've invested in and that you're caring for. So there is a risk of predators and by and large, a lot of work is done in Scotland to use something called acoustic deterrent devices 
and there's a great deal of research and expertise at the University of St Andrews and the um, Sea Mammal Research Unit there to make sure that those ADDs are um, using frequencies and patterns of noise that are effective and not harmful. And there's been many, many research projects done and, and um, innovation and, and there's a, there's a Scottish company called Ace Aquatech that I think just won the Queen's Award for Export, is that right? Um, who, who make an acoustic deter deterrent device. And these are devices that if they can make them successfully in Scotland, they can sell them to every fish farming operation in anywhere in the world, including Chile with her, with her sea lions. Um, unfortunately, Stuart, who, who, who answered the original question, uh, has left. So I'm going to see if I can bring bring this back in. The, the, the question, really, that Stuart asked was relating to the uh, Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee's report. Um, I'm sure you will have all read the report. Um, that report, and there are two members of, of the committee, Kate, who was on the committee, and Donald, who is still on the committee, um, who, who participated in that report. Can I... Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm struggling a little bit at this stage to understand exactly your views on that report. So perhaps you could just clarify to the committee, do you recognise that report and, and, and the criticisms, criticisms that were within that report, or do you not recognise that report as being a, a view of where the industry is at the yeah. moment? Um, and maybe, James, you could start that off. Yeah, so I suppose my take would be that this is actually quite a young industry. So if you compare it to, to you know, land, land farming and agriculture, which we've been doing for hundreds and thousands of years, where there remain real challenges around animal health. If you look at the sheep industry, where there's a percentage of lambs born in Scotland each year that will never make the food chain due to disease and, and weather and various environmental factors. 20 to 30 percent of cattle will present for slaughter with, with uh, liver fluke, a disease of the liver. So um, raising animals is tough and it's difficult because you're dealing with biological factors and environmental factors. Um, I don't think any uh, sector of the food and drink industry has a, fu has a future without embracing almost a kind of zero tolerance of uh, mortality, uh, of any kind of uh, disease issue, and there should be a, a continual appetite to improve. So I think um, if, the, you know, if the individual company was sat here, are they... Um, content with where we are on mortality as an example, I would expect they would say no. I would certainly hope they would say no. So I don't think this industry uh, is perfect. I don't think the industry itself would say it is perfect. I, th I believe from, from having worked with them, I think they are absolutely up for embracing world-class standards of production. Um, I think they absolutely accept there are improvements to be made. I think that those, the, the interests in achieving those improvements are no more stark than they are for the companies and the industry itself. I mean, ultimately, losses cost money, they affect reputation, and we've talked about you know, the importance of, of brand, and, and Scotland and Scottish salmon sells on its brand, uh, food quality and environmental credentials. So um, I think there are uh, challenges the industry has, um, but my sense is they recognise them, and, I, and my sense is there is a desire for improvement. I think the investment that they're putting into innovation and the fact we have an Aquaculture Innovation Centre that Heather represents today uh, is a signal that there's a desire to do, to do better. So do you recognise the report the, 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 and, and the contents of that report? Yes, I do. But before you cut me off, well, I, 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 I think... It's a straight yes, no answer. So, yeah, so. I, 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 abs I absolutely recognise the contents of the report. I think, however, in, in, to put that in context, I think in Scotland we have you know, a, a, a spirit and a desire to embrace world-class standards of production. And my, my overarching point would be that the one thing we know for certain is demand is increasing. Demand for global protein is increasing and demand for Scottish salmon is increasing. And today and every day this week and the rest of the year, we'll eat a million meals involving salmon in the UK. And I would far rather we met that demand from systems in Scotland, which we can control and where we can add the economic value here, than have that demand met elsewhere. Because if, if, for example, we had a moratorium or we stopped producing, that demand will not go away. We've merely met from systems we have no control over. I, I, I don't think that's what the report suggested. But, Elaine, do you want to, to, to answer that? And, and, and a brief answer would be, because I know now members of, of that committee would like to come in on, on the back of that. Yeah, so I actually very much agree uh, with the comments that 
James has made. And I would just like to say that um, I don't think any, the growth of any sector and the development of any sector can be viewed in isolation. It should be viewed holistically in terms of growth for the economy and for regions within the economy in an evidence, fact-based manner. And I think it is very fair to say, having spoke to industry extensively, um, in fact, yesterday at Seafood Expo Global, that they are very cognizant um, of the challenges that were highlighted in the report. But I think work is well underway to address some of the challenges that, that are highlighted. Heather. Uh, I, I recognize a number of issues that the report covers. I suppose I have a, a slight issue with the underlying premise, which is, appears to be that Scottish salmon farming is in, in and of itself bad and is having a negative effect on the environment. And that doesn't seem to me the right mindset to approach things. Um, I think what the industry would say is that they fully own and recognise that they are responsible for optimal fish growth and welfare minimising impacts. And that's partly why in the three and a half years that SAIC's been in existence, uh, they've invested with us in 23 different research projects largely focused and on dealing with some of the issues that the Environment Report talks about. Um, so of our £34 million worth of projects, £22 million of that is industry hard cash. So they are putting significant millions of pounds of, of investment into Scottish universities to help solve the problems that they are experiencing in Scottish waters. And that seems to me a sign of a mature and responsible industry that wants to tackle the problems it's facing. Donald, do you want us to come in? Yes, thank you. Good morning. And as the convener said, I'm the reporter from the from the Eclair Committee. Um, just in terms of what what you've just said, Heather. I mean, I, I have to, with the greatest respect, sort of disagree with your your characterisation of the report. I think what the report, in fairness, says is that um, aquaculture has to operate to the highest environmental standards, and at present, it is not. And I think underlying the report and the concerns of the committee is this, this projected expansion uh, of doubling you know, from 160,000 tonnes to, to double that in, I think, 15 years. And I think the, to, to put the concerns of the Eclair Committee on record, our concerns are effectively that if that expansion happens and the industry is currently not operating to the highest environmental standards, then frankly we have a problem. Um, I don't know if Kate Forbes is, uh, I'm sure she would um, add to that, but I, I, I just think it's important to put the Eclair Committee's views on record in the report and the summary letter, I think, um, enshrines those views. Um, my own question, I suppose, to you is, uh, what, do you not agree that it is in the interest of the product to be produced to the highest environmental standards, that people want to eat salmon that is, you know, they know is produced to the highest environmental standards. Uh, yes, uh, I mean that, that's that, you know that's a very very straightforward answer, and and in some ways it comes back to <coughs> the point we made earlier about consumer retail and, uh, um, perceptions and scrutiny will drive more improvements than I think anything and. You know, we see it in the realms of food waste, plastics, obviously a huge issue just now. A large part of the, the seal issue is about uh, consumer um, assurance and welfare. Um, so I think that, you know, the, the growth that we, we that I certainly would like to see, and I want, to, I want to see the aquaculture industry grow in Scotland. I think it has huge potential benefits, and I think it's, you know, the environmental, uh, sorry, the social and economic sustainability are as important factors as environmental sustainability, but that should only happen on the basis of supporting companies that embrace the highest standards of, of, of regulation. And I think I would encourage, as a, you know, as, as uh, you know, as a consumer and someone who lives in Scotland and, uh, you know, values its landscape and its natural heritage, I would only want to see that growth if it meets, you know, not just bare minimum standards, but world leading standards. And that will how it will help us sell in Brussels as they're doing just now, in Singapore as they're doing uh, later on this week, that, that will help sell the, sell the product. James, you, you started off very well with a very short answer and, <laughs> and then it got extremely <laughs> long. Um, so I, but I'd, I'd like to bring uh, Kate in and then I'll come to you alone if I may. Kate. Uh, thank you very much. And I just want to focus on one particular area and that is mortalities, which James Withers has already uh, referenced. Do you, you've obviously said the industry is not satisfied with the current level of mortality and I mean, 
Do you believe that the current level of mortality is acceptable in light of the level of mortality that you would accept in any other food source? And secondly, everybody is quite happy to say that something's not acceptable, but what should be done and by whom to address this? Because not only does that mortality rate have a negative impact on the environment, but also on investors and consumers. Um, I don't know who'd like to start on that. Um, James, do you want to go on that? Or Elaine? Elaine, I said I'd get, let you come in first, so I probably should. Do you, do you want to answer that particular question? So um, the short answer is that I'm quite confident that the industry is not satisfied with the current mortality rate. And that is evident through the innovation activity that both producers and businesses in the upstream supply chain um, the investments that they're making, the strides that they're making forwards um, around, around mortalities, and the, the investments, the very significant investments that even SMEs, not necessarily our, all our large businesses, are making. Uh, yesterday, I had a conversation um, with one of our uh, salmon producing companies, and they spoke about um, a very proactive approach that they have taken with uh, at least two other farming companies in a very specific geographical location um, to address mortalities. Um, now, I, I understand that quite often when you have mortality events, it creates a sense of urgency and a sense to act. But what these businesses are doing is stepping, stepping back from large productivity numbers in order to address short-term challenges, to look at that longer-term growth opportunity. Um, they're working together um, around some very localised, for example, um, fish management operations. They're synchronising treatments, for example. So I think um, the question around um, are businesses happy with mortality rates, I think the answer to that is no. And I think they are proactively addressing that. And if we look at the, the fish uh, health welfare work that's going on that Heather will be able to speak much more eloquently than I about, I think that is a very good example of industry leading the way, supported by the public sector and wider stakeholders to take ownership for improving the current situation. Heather, do you want to come in as you've been introduced into that one? <laughs> Thank you. So, the causes of mortality in fish farming come from bacteria in the environment, viruses in the environment, parasites in the environment, um, potentially uh, insufficient or poor nutrition and feeding, um, potentially human error uh, or physical trauma where you have a big storm and, and the fish all get slashed against, uh, slammed against a net and, and get bruised. So there's, there's lots of different causes of mortality and I think that every farming company that I know of is seeking to minimise their mortalities because that's lost profits. So it costs them significant amounts of lost profit in having mortalities. What can we do about mortalities? Well, we can improve water quality because fish thrive in a highly oxygenated environment. We can vaccinate against some of the diseases that have been identified that fish have that then have led to research to, to develop a vaccine. So there's something called bacterial kidney disease, um, pancreatic disease. There are a number of different vaccines and pharmaceutical companies that have worked with, worked with industry to help identify what are the causes of mortality and how can we then prevent them. And we know that in human populations, vaccination is a very successful strategy. Um, we can have the best possible management and husbandry to minimise the risk of disease outbreak, and that's through your stocking densities. Uh, it's through how often you handle the fish, and you want to do that as little as possible because they, they actually suffer stress in the same way that, that we would suffer stress. And, and if you crowd them too much, they, their performance goes down, their eating quality goes down. So the retailers will specify all manner of aspects of how the fish farming companies have to try and make sure that their fish are as healthy and, and um, ready for market as possible. And they want every fish that they put to sea to come back out again. Um, so, so to answer the question, are there too many mortalities? Yes, there are, but people are doing everything they can to bring them down. Do you, sorry, just before I come back to Kate, do you want to just quantify those mortalities as a percentage of, of fish that go to sea? Can you do that? Or I don't have that data, but I'm sure that the SSP I mean, would do. I've read in the press somewhere it's between 20 and 25%. Does that, does that sound about right? Sorry, Kate. 
Yeah, I mean, I, mean I, I was just going to say, do you think we're moving fast enough on this? I mean, if mortality rates are hitting record highs in 2016, and there would be, I would imagine, an absolute outcry if mortality rates in any other form of agriculture hit those same rates, we would just not stand for it. So why is fish farming any different? And do you think we're moving fast enough in terms of the innovation to reduce that? Uh, looks like that's you again, Heather. <laughs> um, the, the, there's been a significant trend in the past five years of increased mortalities because of disease problems, partly correlated to rising seawater temperatures, partly correlated to um, viruses and diseases becoming evident in Scottish waters that weren't previously. So there are diseases that started in Tasmania and then went to Ireland and somehow have come to Scotland. Once you've got them in your environment, you can't get rid of them. Um, so there are... What can we do about that? Again, perfectly fair question. One of the biggest causes of mortality in the past couple of years has been something called complex gill disease. So that's about how the, how the fish breathe. Um, there was an international conference uh, in Galway two weeks ago that the industry was at, Scottish researchers were at, members of the Scottish Innovation Centre were at, looking at how do you find answers to these complex gill issues? And one of the things that Scotland would like to do is become the, the host and the expert of that international forum so that we do as much research as we possibly can to solve the problems that we know are happening here but are also happening around the world. And that's one of the things that comes through in terms of academic and industry and international research collaborations that um, you need to draw on the expertise of what have the Tasmanians learnt about gill disease, how do we apply it to Scotland, how do we make... Um, the best possible interventions to minimise mortality rate. Just, just before we leave that, if I may, just ask one further question on, on, on that gill disease, is that um, wh when it starts to develop, um, uh, I certainly attended the Eclair committee and, and asked the question, mm. is there anything they can do once the disease starts to develop? And the answer was to harvest the fish uh, before, before the fish die from the disease. Do, do you think that hides the, the, the actual true depth of the problem? Is it bigger than the 20 or 25% mortality? And maybe just to put that into context, I'm going to declare an interest in that I'm a farmer. And, and sadly, when you're carving, for example, you will accept a small mortality uh, in the region of 4%, which is, is probably a reasonable level, which there's nothing you can do about. We're talking about a figure in excess of four or five times this in the salmon farming industry. So maybe you could just explain that, that, that gill disease. And do you think it's bigger than the industries there because they're harvesting fish earlier? I, I simply don't know the answer to that question. I suppose I would just make one observation, which um, I, I learned from having a conversation with uh, the Scottish Government's chief vet in terms of the comparison of mortality rates between land-based animals and fish. Um, the way that fish spawn is that they generate... 100,000 eggs per fish and not 100,000 eggs of, of those fish are going to become wild salmon from wild salmon rivers or any other grown up fish whereas calves, cows have one calf or possibly two. So the mortality rates of fish are not analogous to the mortality rates of land animals okay. according to Scotland's chief vet. Um, I'm, I'm sure there are subtle differences between fish and animals. I'm sure we'll accept that, John. Um, perhaps you'd like to move on with your next question. Yes, well, I think that follows on quite well because uh, we just talked about mortality and Ms Jones gave us a very wide uh, range of reasons for that. But one of our fascinations in this committee is sea lice. And I'm amazed that we've got as far through the committee so far <laughs> without too much mention of them. So I'm really looking, first of all, for a kind of general comment as to what your views are on sea lice. Um, again, we've heard that some farms are doing extremely well. We've heard in other countries they have stricter controls. Again, the uh, Aquaculture Stewardship Council was suggesting their normal limit is 0.1 female louse per fish, uh, which seems quite low and I think lower than we are achieving. So um, are you content with the policy as it is at the moment? Should we be tightening up? Should we be copying Norway a bit more? keen to give Heather a break because I think she's been under the microscope. Does anyone else on the panel wish to come in on that or, or do I have to by default go to Heather to answer that? Um, Elaine. I can give Heather a few minutes of respite but, but not too much because Heather is the expert uh, on this panel in that area. Uh, 
but it is fair to say that producing companies with the support of innovative businesses in the supply chain are deploying a wide range of strategies to tackle sea lice. So um, whilst um, treatments remain an option, there, there are an increasing number um, of options such as baths, thermalizers, hydrolyzers, and we have some very um, ambitious supply chain companies coming through and working very much hand in glove with producers to look at some of these solutions. Um, when we meet industry, um, although we are an economic and community development agency, we are always keen to understand their challenges as much as we are to understand their opportunities and how we can work with the industry going forwards. And one of the companies um, in Scotland who's had uh, localised but very challenging problems with sea lice and who have deployed uh, not one or two but multiple um, approaches to tackling sea lice and who have been working in collaboration with their neighbours in the geographies which they operate um, were telling me yesterday that from March 2017 to March 2018 they had seen an 87 percent reduction in adult female lice per salmon so and, I think could you give us what that figure was and is not, not in my brief notes. I received a presentation from them yesterday, right, which okay, unfortunately they don't have with them. I would suggest that next week, when you receive evidence from some of the producers, they will be able to give you much more detailed information on what they are actually doing in their businesses mm -hmm. on this. I mean, in, I'm just getting a little bit of an impression, you know, quite a laissez-faire, if you like, or let the producers are taking all this very seriously, not just from yourself, Ms. Jimison, but from everyone. Whereas in Norway, again, we get the impression that it's much more kind of proactive and they've got these green and yellow and red zones. And if I understand it correctly, if you're in a red, if, if you get too much, too many lice per fish, you go over the Norwegian limit, you're then in a red zone, you have to automatically reduce the amount of stock that you have and they won't allow more farms in that area. So that suggests that, you know, it, it, rather than just leaving it to the individual producer, that they will benefit with less lice, that actually the government or someone should be coming in or could be coming in and imposing more. Are you in favour of that? I don't actually think I'm in a position okay, um, enough, right. to comment right. on that. I think okay, that, right. that rests with well, the I'll industry. I'll send that to Ms Jones yes. after once, yes. Right. <laughs> Heather, it looks, like, <laughs> looks like you've had a chance to gather your thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do my very best. Um, I think the Norwegian system is, is being introduced rather than has been implemented up till now. Um, the industry has its own code of good practice on when treatment should happen. Uh, there are treatment thresholds that are um, below that and, and there are times when you want to treat at an individual net pen level rather than just monitoring at the whole farm level. So the way in which that the industry has improved their control of lice is to change some of their sampling protocols, um, to intervene earlier, uh, and to try and minimise the risk of the exponential growth that you get in this devastatingly devious parasite that we haven't yet found a way to bang on the head. Um, it's worth saying that salmon go to sea completely devoid of lice. They are utterly clean. They come out of freshwater hatcheries and they are, they are pristine. They get lice, just like Labradors when you go walking in the countryside, from wild, in my case, wild deer. Uh, you get ticks on your, on your dog and, and you get wild fish that carry lice that then go into the farmed environment. Um, so the... Sorry. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm just making the observation that, that in the same way that, that smolts go to sea uh, from rivers, they're clear of lice as well and their passage through the fish farm areas, as you know, um, is relatively short. And when they come back, it may be their passage through is short as well. So it's a naturally occurring parasite, and, and I don't think it would be right, uh, Heather, to blame it on either side, just as an outset. So, sorry, what I'm saying is that it's, it's a parasite that is endemic <coughs> and pervasive and highly prevalent in the water column. It's okay. in the environment. Um, so if you put fish into a seawater environment, there will always be a risk that they will get lice. Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry, you, uh, you, you continue. I've slightly sorry. lost my train of thought. Um, <coughs> I think the point really is that you, obviously companies want to treat 
in a way that minimises lice and minimises the impact of the lice on their fish and on their mortalities, and also, therefore, the potential impact on other species. But there have been some studies done on what's the impact of sea lice on wild salmon from farm fish. And the, the most persuasive study I've seen is from uh, Irish academics, and it says that of all the causes of reduced mortality of wild salmon, sea lice is possibly 1% of the cause. So yes, it's an effect, but it's one of many other effects that cause a decline in wild salmon stocks. And there are many things that can be done to improve the return rates of wild salmon stocks. And there are many things that we can't do anything about to return the wild return rate of, of salmon stocks. So we can't change uh, seawater temperatures rising um, off Faroes and, and Iceland, and we can't change the fact that what they predate on is, is not as available to them. And we can't change the fact that lots and lots of wild seals eat lots and lots of wild salmon. What we can do is try and minimise the impacts, and I think that's what the industry tries to do. Mm -hmm. I suppose, you know, in a sense, there's two questions here. I mean, there's the, the question of the, uh, the good of the fish and the, and the uh, return that the farm can get. But I'm, I'm also concerned, having referred already to the Aquaculture Stewardship Council and similar, that even if their limit was a bit arbitrary at 0.1 per fish, if that became you know, widely accepted in supermarkets in Germany and America and lots of places, mm -hmm. is there a danger that we miss that? We, we don't have ASC or any other accreditation. <coughs> I think the committee's going to do some more work on that bit. Mm -hmm. Um, and that, um, you, you know, to protect the Scottish industry, you know, we as a whole, we as a society need to do more. And, for example, SEPA have been criticised for not visiting often enough unannounced visits. Mm -hmm. Am I right in thinking that there's, that's a kind of worry as well at the side? I think the only way to answer the question of at what point should you intervene is to have some really good science that tells you the best time to intervene is either at 0.5 of an invigorous female or 0.2 or whatever it might be. But just because the ASC has 0.1 and Norway has some other number, it will depend on the way in which you're farming, the location, the seawater temperatures, the uh, currents, and all sorts of other factors. There's plenty of locations in Scotland that do not suffer from any sea lice problems whatsoever. And then there are other individual sites that are very prone to sea lice pressures. So that's about where you site the farm. So again, you can think about expanding growth, for example, in Orkney, where you get incredible tidal flow exchanges between the North Sea and the Atlantic, and you don't have a lice problem. Could, could I just ask Mr Withers then about this issue? I mean, d how does he see the supermarkets, especially internationally, going on this? Are they going to be looking for ASC accreditation or some other accreditation? Will they take into account the number of lice? So that even though, you know, there's reasons why lice should be different in different areas, you know, I suspect the supermarket in Germany might not understand that fully and would just have a kind of very fixed line. Yeah, I mean, I mean, accreditation is, is uh, you know, a gateway into the retail industry, whether it's British retail consortium accreditation at processing level, whether it's the Code of Good Practice SSPO have, whether it's you know, the likes of uh, uh, MSC uh, accreditation. So accreditation will be a given. I think the challenge for the industry is there's a lot of accreditation out there beyond the fact the retailers have their own as well. On the specific of the lice, I honestly don't know. I honestly don't know whether that will become a factor, uh, a factor in future. So, do you, well, if, sorry, if I can just have one <laughs> final supplementary on that. So do you think the retailers tend, or do most of the retailers tend to have their own accreditation, or are they relying on other people to do the accreditation? It often t tends to be a combination of both. Right. So something like British Retail Consortium is part of GFSI, which is a global food standards uh, set that's recognised globally. BRC is part of that. That's your entry point. But often you'll find in, you know, if, if, if and less about, uh, I don't know as much about the fish side, but if you're a vegetable producer and you're supplying the major retails, you'll have to be BRC accredited and you'll almost certainly get an inspection and in a different system from every single individual retailer as well. So you may have, you know, four or five unannounced inspections. And I know a number of the retailers will, you know, inspect salmon farms yeah, themselves. John. That's great. Thanks so much. John. Briefly bring it, you it, in. It is a very brief point, and, and it is to James. James, and, and, and I welcome your, your, your comments there. And if I were sitting where you had been sitting earlier, I wouldn't have wanted to talk on this because, given your role, this is clearly a very negative thing. But public perception is hugely important. Even the term lice, it's not a, a term we want to talk about. Um, 
Do you not have deep concerns about even the fact we're having to discuss this? I th no, I think, you know, it's, it's an issue. Uh, mortality is an issue, and it's a, an issue in every form of animal production. My own view is that, that the industry will benefit in the long term if it's open about the fact it has production challenges and it wants to, to seek to address them. So I think the, the alternative is saying that it isn't an issue, we try and bury our heads and hope no one talks about it. My, uh, my expectation would be that is not going to be a particularly helpful strategy in the longer term, will almost certainly come back and bite us. So I think, we should, I think the kind of debate we're having now about not if there is a problem, but how do we tackle it is a pretty healthy one. Thank you. That's for you, Thank you, John. Uh, Colin, yours is the next question. Thanks, Convener. The question I've got is, is quite a specific question around the recommendation of the Environment Committee uh, on the role of Marine Scotland. The, the, the committee um, report stated, and I'll quote from the report, an examination of the role of Marine Scotland as both regulator and policy advocate for development uh, should take place. There's an opportunity to align with other food and drink sectors in Scotland by moving the development role into the Scottish Government's Food, Drink and Rural Communities Division. Can I ask the panel if you have a, a, a view on this recommendation or any thoughts on, on the pros and cons of this particular recommendation? Who would like to start with that? Heather, a, a volunteer. I'll be, I'll be brief. I think it's already happened. Mm. Uh, I think there are people working in the food and drink division within the agricultural directorate that are responsible for the, the food promotion side of, of salmon and that the Marine Scotland side is about regulation, as far as I understand. So, so there's, no, there's no policy development work taking place by Marine Scotland at the moment? That's all being moved into the Scottish Government? Sorry, the, the policy work that's being done in the food and drink but is around the case for food and drink and, and salmon being part of the expansion of Sc Scotland's food production system. Um, there are policy, there's a lot of policy thinking going on just now between um, the government and the industry around the, a farm fish health framework, which I know uh, Mr Ewing is very keen to see developed and delivered. Um, but that's about regulation, or it's about improving the performance of the industry in terms of how it how it creates value for Scotland. Okay. Yeah. Gail, you've got to follow on to that. Um, yeah, um, it's, it's the, the same report, actually, James. It's the Aquaculture Growth to 2030 report. And w one of the recommendations is the introduction of innovation sites. Um, do we have any progress on that? The bad news for Heather is, I think that's probably one for uh, for Heather at Agriculture Innovation Centre. But that was, yeah, there were there were set recommendations that were kind of the top tier ones, and that was right up there in, in bright lights. Heather would be best placed. I think she's technically the body responsible for the delivery of that particular recommendation. I think in the report. <laughs> so the industry have had a number of discussions uh, with government about um, the, the scope for innovation around sites and equipment. Um, We've been doing some funding of uh, new equipment and new technologies that will, might improve the performance of production. Um, so that piece of work is ongoing and uh, there's some action, I think, with the government to consider what would be permissible within the regulatory framework that we operate under. Okay, thanks. Uh, the next questions are Peter. Right, thanks, convener. I'm, I'm going to focus a wee bit about CEPA's role I recognise we haven't a CEPA representative here, but nevertheless, uh, CEPA are in the process of changing their approach to regula regulation because they recognise that the status quo is not an option. Uh, one of the, some of the issues they're looking at is protecting the environment and biodiversity by ensuring fish production is matched to the environmental capacity. They're also looking at increasing the capture and beneficial use of the waste, reducing medicine release into the environment and supporting action to protect wild fish amongst others. So will the changes that CEPA are proposing in their sector plan improve regulation of the sector and are further changes needed on top of that, that I've, some of the ones I've mentioned? <laughs> if so, what? I'm, 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 I'm feeling <laughs> sorry for you, Heather, in the sense that <laughs> everyone looks away and, uh, or looks at you um, as if... Yeah. Uh, so I'm trying to give you a chance to gather your sure. thoughts as well. And yeah. could I just say that one of, one, one of the points there... Um, that we have perhaps haven't touched on is, is increasing the capture of beneficial use of waste um, you might like to pick up on. Um, so, Heather, mm -hmm. as you've now had a chance to gather your <laughs> thoughts, would you, would you like to start sure. off on that? I mean, I, I don't think I'm 
particularly well placed to comment on what SEPA's role should and shouldn't be and how well they're doing it. Because mm. um, I, don't, I don't have the insight to, to really offer a view on that. Um, I'm, I'm very sure that the work that they're doing with the industry is about better regulation and better outcomes. So whatever changes they're trying to make, we've, we've heard uh, Terry Ahern talk about the One Planet vision, and that's very much what SEPA are committed to. And I think Anne Anderson that you saw last week actually has a title as you know Chief of Going Beyond Compliance. And so that, that set of discussions and that thinking is going on between the regulator and the industry. Okay, does anyone else want to, to come in on that? Peter, you've got another question there. Oh, you, sorry, no. Heather, you didn't touch on the uh, capture and beneficial use of waste. Do you want to talk about that as, as an innovation, no. or do you want to...? I confess I don't know anything about it. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, I, I do recognise that, you know, we haven't a SEPA representative here, so it is, you know, I, I do do realise it's, it's difficult. Have you any thoughts on what environmental data should SEPA licences be based on? Is that something you would, could comment on? No. no. We're struggling I, here. I, I, I think we may be struggling on these questions, so <laughs> we... Uh, James. Convenient, yeah. yeah, yeah. Just, just to give, uh, <laughs> James, always delighted to bring you in on well this well one. Well James. How kind. Um, uh, just an observation I would make, actually, about the, the relationship between SEPA and, and the industry, which um, I think is suboptimal, would probably be a good description of it in, 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 uh, in recent years. And I've seen examples in other sectors where that was the case as well. And I would, uh, probably agriculture would be one, but whiskey would be another, actually, where probably if you went back 10 to 15 years ago and you asked SEPA, what set, do you have a sector you have a concern about? Whiskey might well be up there, but they developed a really strong relationship with that industry body. Uh, you know, the SWA, uh, Scottish Whiskey Association, would be at the forefront of writing a um, a kind of proactive plan, so a partnership developed. So I think it moved away from a model where SEPA is simply acts as policeman, but rather acts as a partner, partner in improvement. My sense is, both from, I think, Terry O'Hearn's leadership and those that are directly involved, that there's much greater scope for developing that kind of partnership approach now, whereas before, I think you had industry here, SEPA over there, that said, industry, you crack on, and we're the policeman that will come and, come and look and come and enforce if necessary. Mm. I think that is an old-world model that needs... Um, consigned to the dustbin, to be honest, and a much more proactive approach can now be taken. And I think there are good examples, whether it's bathing waters in, in terms of agriculture, whether it is the whiskey industry and use of water and resources that, that can be used as a model for, for aquaculture. And I think that's starting to happen. Mm. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I think we'll move on to the next set of questions. Uh, Jamie Green, that's you. Uh, thank you, convener, and uh, good morning, panel. Um, I've kept very quiet throughout this whole session listening great intent. Uh, it's been a fascinating discussion. I, I will touch briefly on the point that I was asked to, to look at, and that's around research, development, innovation in the industry. And then I'll maybe conclude with just one sort of final question, which is more of an overview on the future of the industry and looking for some commentary on that. On research and development, it seems to be that much of the research is very technically led. So it's around addressing specific production issues that we're aware of. Uh, it's around uh, the environmental aspects of, of production, etc. Um, but very little um, is spoken around uh, innovation in the industry in terms of uh, the economic uh, or management aspects of it. Um, I wondered if anyone uh, had any comments or views on how uh, we, you know, research innovation could better help facilitate uh, um, effective growth of the industry that isn't just focused on the technical aspects of how growth can be, uh, growth can take place. James. Um, so I think there's a huge area of innovation beyond simply, I suppose, addressing some of the biological challenges that there are, uh, and they're the same that are relevant across a whole number of sectors in the food and drink industry, from sustainable packaging through to improvements in logistics. Um, I'm quite hopeful on, on that front in a sense that there's two kind of initiatives that have developed over the last um, wee while that offer, I think, some hope about Scotland being the home of real innovation right through the supply chain in, in aquaculture as well as just the primary production piece. Uh, one is a project called Make Innovation Happen, which is bringing together what was previously about 150 different support tools that existed for, for food businesses that wanted to innovate under one roof, one website, one, one phone number. The second is a, 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 slight, a bit more tangential, but the, the coming together of 
Scotland's research institutes under the Safari collaboration, so the likes of the Rowett Institute uh, leading on nutrition, the Morden Institute, which has traditionally been about um, livestock uh, production and animal health on land, as well as um, uh, the James Hutton Institute, SRUC. Um, them coming together, I think, offers a real hope to better translate some of the research we've got down onto, onto the ground, either in farm or in, in processing. And I think some of the work that's gone on into endemic production diseases in, in livestock, in terms of feed conversion, biological efficiency uh, in land animals, is transferable over in, into, um, into the water. So I th I th I'm, I, the, and the, a lot of the innovation will be about market-led innovation, so around nutrition and health, people wanting to uh, improve um, their dietary balance, their food intake, as well as think about wider things like sustainable packaging. There's a lot of innovation happening there, and I think your, your point is important that we don't just focus on some of the production challenges, but actually the wider market and efficiency opportunities mm -hmm. there are. Okay, so I've got a wee break here on innovation. At Highlands and Islands Enterprise, we are very ambitious um, alongside our businesses for growth through innovation across the breadth of the supply chain and we're looking both upstream and downstream and innovation is not only about capturing challenges it's about creating high value opportunities in the economy and in particular from my role in the rural economy and capturing as much value in Scotland as we possibly can. Now, innovation takes many forms um, at the Scottish Aquaculture Innovation Centre. It's focused on uh, business to academic partnerships, but we also look at business to business collaborations, not only to solve challenges that, that are here and now, but also to look further ahead and into the future. And we also support businesses individually. And if I can just give you one example that's very live at the moment and is taking up uh, quite a bit of my colleagues' time. It's a project called Aquasense. And it's focused on, it's very much at the conceptual stage at the moment, and it's taking the aquaculture industry as a whole, so we're looking at both finfish and shellfish production in Shetland, but we're working across three innovation centres, SAIC, iBio and Data Lab, to look at how we can use many things um, that capture real-time data to inform real-time activity, so you can view what is happening remotely and make some very in well-informed decisions on what you do in your finfish or your shellfish farm so that you can become much more predictive um, in your approach to business over the medium to longer term and so that you have a very robust set of, set of data over the longer term that is a very hard evidence base that is capturing as much information as possible holistically about what is happening in a region. At the moment, as I say, we are working with a range of stakeholders. We're being led very much by industry. We're working um, with SOXA from the University of Strathclyde and the satellite catapult to develop this. And we are submitting a bid to the Industrial Structural Challenge Fund for, for a sizable amount of money to help to bring this forward. So that's around some of our wider ambition around innovation and, and what's going on at the moment. I think what's key to innovation is skills and training as well, and having people in our country with the right level of skills and knowledge, be that acquired through the academic pathway or through the vocational pathway. And there's a lot of work going on across industry and across the public sector partnership and stakeholders to, to really um, empower people in Scotland to have, uh, so that the aquaculture sector is a positive career destination and it is also a very progressive career destination and it is accessible to all. So there's, a, there's work to be done and, and underway in touching school leavers, for example, or, or young people and the people who influence young people, but also making the industry very accessible to more mature entrants as well. And a very good example of that is the SVQ level four in fish farm management, which allows people to learn, to develop, and to make a very positive contribution to the sector at a later stage in their life. Now, um, I'm going to give Heather a bigger break because I'm going to bring Gail in because she's got a question on the track. Uh, uh, well, Gail, your question. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, I know in the HIE report that said that um, attracting staff is difficult. Um, <clears throat> I was up the West Coast to my constituency a couple of weeks ago and spoke to a number of people that said that the jobs are there, the people want the jobs, but it's access to housing 
that's preventing them in a lot of small communities. And I just wonder if you had a comment on that. I'm going to give that to Elaine and then I'm going to come back to Heather to answer the rest of the questions. Hey, Elaine. I'm not going to disagree with you on that at all. We hear that from our businesses. Um, it's more challenging in some areas of the Highlands and Islands than it is in other areas. I think infrastructure um, is key to a successful sector, and I think we'll see in Norway, for example, if we look at roads infrastructure, IT infrastructure, they are further ahead than, of, than, than we are, and there are some challenges for us there because if, if we set aside housing as an infrastructure challenge, actually attracting people to work in our remote and rural areas or attracting our young people back to our remote and rural areas. They expect to be able to use a mobile phone. They expect to be able to get on the internet. One actual quite positive thing um, from the aquaculture industry specifically is that they are actually accelerating the speed of some infrastructure developments in the region. So if I go back to the Aquasense project, there may be an opportunity to improve uh, mobile connectivity in some remote and rural areas and if we look at the Isle of Mull for example where Scottish sea farms actually needed very good broadband connectivity they went ahead and did it but that's now a community asset that people can use so to answer your question about housing yes it is a problem but but infrastructure is something that we need to to consider as well thank you Heather you've had a good break to <laughs> marshal your thoughts to go back to Jamie's question so there's, there's a lot of technological development going on around um, the crunching of big data, uh, the use of sensors and imaging systems, so subsea cameras. Um, we've actually sponsored a project that's looking at the, um, a DNA grab of, of the sediment below sea cages so that you can, you can do a sample of that and you get much quicker uh, responses to finding out what the impacts are. So there's an awful lot of new technology that's being applied into the industry. Um, as, as Elaine said, they would like to see there being strong broadband so that an internet of things allows better farm management. And it's the same in, in land-based agriculture of, of agritech, really transforming the information that farmers have so that they can optimise their feeding regimes, their treatment regimes. Um, so all of this, I think, is coming through. And there are some quite innovative young Scottish companies that are contributing to that. Jamie. Uh, that's uh, very helpful, very um, comprehensive answers and very different types of answers. I appreciate those. Um, and it sounds like there's some great work being done, especially using technology to uh, advance research. But I guess as we're approaching the end of the session, I, if I could take a step back to uh, summarise um, a, a theme that's come through many of these sessions, and that's squaring the circle of how we achieve quite significant growth in the industry that many people are looking for, but yet still address the very valid and substantive concerns uh, around the envir environmental impact that that growth may come, and that's reflected in the Eclair Committee, because we know that demand is not going away, and if we don't meet that demand, someone else will, as Mr. Mm -hmm. Weather has said. But one thing that I've never been clear on uh, throughout these evidence sessions is who should be responsible for that? Is it industry itself? Is it government? If we look at the Norway approach, where they took a, a more top-down government approach through legislation and policy to, to really control the planning, the regulation, the, 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 the innovation, the growth, in one sense. But here, there seems to be so much wide discourse as to around, around who's responsible, which agency, which bit of government, which bit of industry, which bit of academia. And that's really never been clear to me. Does anyone have a view on who should spearhead that growth and how it can be done in a sustainable way. Um, I think you're all looking as though you're wanting to answer that question. So let, let's do it in a completely different order. We'll start off with Elaine, we'll go to Heather, and then we'll finish with James. I'm not actually going to directly answer your question and say who should spearhead it, but an observation of mine is that the industry, all parties, all stakeholders in the industry have become increasingly collaborative. I'm a great believer in industries should be led by industries. Industry drives economy and, and not the public sector. We are here to support them. So I would be very keen to see, to see industry um, come forward with some solutions and, and a call to action to the public sector as to how we should support them. I think as the industry, which is becoming increasingly sophisticated, I should add, continues to move forward, we all have a responsibility in, in charting that path and in supporting that path and that we should be ambitious for growth 
and not at the expense of environmental sustainability, not at the expense of rural communities, and not at the expense um, of our position in, in a global marketplace. And I think the opulent synergy is having voices at the table who can both be critical friends to one another in the sense that we challenge and that we support that discussion to go forward. So I think there's a big piece about process here, and I think there's a big piece about being focused on outcomes. Who should lead that? Um, I, I don't feel happy to comment on that. Heather. I think the industry set out a vision for seeing an opportunity to grow the Scottish economy by expanding production, um, but in a sustainable way. And, and that's very much captured in one of the infographics in that report, which is three over overlapping uh, circles in a Venn diagram that came from a, a UN um, program about how do you get the optimum solution between economic growth, social benefit and environmental protection. And the industry's ambition is to grow within those three parameters. So I think that you know, this, dis this discourse is really helpful because it's throwing up issues that people want to tease out and want to understand and want to inform government policy on where do things go next. Um, I suppose the flip side is, if you decide you don't want growth, then that has ramifications for economies like Elaine's. Um, and it also has ramifications for the foreign investment that might or might not come to Scotland or it might go to Canada or the Faroes. And that comes back, I think, to James's point, which is global demand will be there. Will Scotland benefit from it and will Scotland's communities benefit from it? Without trashing the environment, nobody at all, least of all farmers, wants to trash the environment. Um, so I think it, it's actually the nature of politics to try and find that answer. Perhaps before James uh, answers, I could comment, though, is that that organic growth has not happened. The production levels are relatively flat in Scotland compared to the substantial growth levels that have happened in other markets. So whilst I hear that it is down to industry, I'm still... I don't see that in reality, as, as that's actually what's happened when you leave it to industry. We, we, we hear a lot about the precautionary approach, and I would say that um, the Depomod model that SEPA have used for the past 20 years has been so precautionary that it has limited growth that could have happened that wouldn't have had damaging effects. And that's not what the perception is. The perception is the opposite. But actually, if you were to ground truth, the and, and this is where taking hard data from the past 20 years of SEPA looking at what the impacts were. Their model forecasted the impact was going to be this, and the impact was actually that. So that amount of growth that you could have had, because this is your, this is your bad growth, this is your bad, bad impact, wasn't achieved because the model said, no, no, we have to, we have to kind of keep it down here. Sorry, the, 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 the model underestimated the capacity of the environment rather than the other way around. In some cases, not in others. So that's why you need, you need feedback loops and data to tell you where you can sustainably grow and where you can't, which I guess comes back to the kind of Norwegian red, amber, green idea. But I suppose my point here would be there hasn't been growth in Scotland because there's been a great deal of precaution and nervousness that, if you were to ground truth the models, wouldn't be proven. James. Um, industry public sector partnership for me is, is, is the single most important uh, answer uh, to that question. I, I would argue strongly that, that food and drink has been an economic success story over the last 10 years. If you strip every, everything away, uh, what's the single biggest reason for that is that there has been an industry and, and public sector partnership. It doesn't mean it's always uh, comfortable. It doesn't mean it's a cosy relationship. Industry challenges government and government challenges industry. But ultimately, industry identified an opportunity a growth opportunity, uh, it believed there would be benefits from that growth opportunity, and agriculture has now done the same, and the, the document has been referred to a couple of times. Um, and so what happens is a system is created, a partnership is created, which doesn't debate should this industry grow, is it important, but how do we help it to grow? Um, so it needs to grow carefully and sustainably, um, but that partnership is what makes it, it happen. We, uh, from a wider food and drink point of view, we rejected the idea of creating a single body that would spearhead it and do it all. We thought we'll lose three to five years of our lives debating structures and pension liabilities and, and all sorts. Instead, 
get a, a partnership form where each individual party has a specific role, but they're built around an agreed objective and opportunity. For me, that is the opportunity in aquaculture. And that will mean you create a form where you can talk about difficult stuff, like gill disease and talk about lice, but do it in a way which is based on we want to try and fix it so we have a stronger platform to, to grow. Thank you. I think that is all the questions that we have. Sorry, I'm looking around the committee members. Uh, John. I thought you were soliciting a question there. Well, uh, uh, um, uh, anyone listening in on this would think you're obsessed with growth. Growth Sorry. is the phrase that's repeated. I mean, surely, surely, wh when there are the challenges that are there, what you would want to do is consolidate and make good. And is enough? Is enough not enough sometimes? What's the obsession with growth? So I, I'm, I'm obsessed with growth. Uh, I, will, I will confess to be a signed up obsessive of growth because I think we add value. And when does that stop, James? We add, we add jobs. It stops when there are, when you st when you, if there's environmental damage, if you're causing undue pressure on communities, on social structures. Um, I think they, they ha you have both regulatory limits and you have natural limits. But what I see in, in this sector and elsewhere is demand growing and an opportunity for Scotland to tap into that, that demand. And I think what the natural protection that's built into this is that we will only grow and we only tap into that demand if we have all the kind of environmental safeguards we, we've talked about. Uh, Elaine. Thank you. I, I think one thing that we haven't touched on here today that, that is of uh, key interest to me is actually community sustainability and community development across the rural economy. And as one of our um, distinct regional opportunities for the Scottish economy at the moment, driven by demand and driven by all of the work that's being done by the industry and by, by those of us who support the industry, is that we shouldn't underestimate what this sector does for the social fabric particularly in our rural economies for Scotland. And I would very welcome the opportunity to, to take that into the debate. So what might not necessarily be apparent at the beginning is, is the valuable contribution that the, the very existence of these businesses in our rural economy and the increased investment, innovation and the higher quality jobs, what that brings to the social fabric of Scotland. So that's not about growth, that's about inclusive growth and that's about sustainability of our communities. And if I can pick out just a few very, very random and probably disconnected examples to give you a peppering. Um, if we look at, at food and drink, salaries sit around the minimum and to the living wage. And, and that is a challenge that James and I and our colleagues in the Food and Drink Partnership are working hard to, to address. But if look, we look... Uh, Elaine, sorry, can I stop you there? Sorry. Growth and everything except terms and conditions for the people who are delivering it. I was about How's that a challenge? That's something that should be worn. I was about to say that in aquaculture, we're seeing significant growth in the type of quality of employment opportunities that people have in the career pathways that they have and in the opportunities that they have. And we're also seeing it within the communities that they live. So growth is much more than the business growth. Growth is about in the rural economy and the communities that live there. So, just for the avoidance of doubt, Highlands and Island Enterprise is committed to growing the wages and terms and conditions of workers in the aquaculture sector? Is that in all saying? sectors, absolutely all sectors, but this that's is a sector reassuring. where we see success. We can work together on that. Um, <laughs> and, I, and I think that's, that, that's a point of consensus which probably would end that line of, of, of questioning, John, Elaine. Um, I think we ad actually have come to the end of our, 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 our questions, so I'd like to thank James, Elaine and Heather for coming along to the committee today and giving evidence. It, it's been a very interesting session and uh, thank you for your time. That concludes our, our meeting today, so I'd like to uh, conclude the meeting there. Thank you.